he's a rich person or he's a middle class person or he's compelled to buy because he's he has been told you have to get a suit on that account so accordingly he decides then he also gets a measurement so its measurement means he has understanding at in our internal audit what i call the audit universe or you know the audit planning so he decides what kind of work i have to work on this particular person then he decide the right kind of you know texture what kind of suit will suit him fine what kind of fall what kind of design i can give it to him what color will suit him fine so similarly we also create what i call the checklist for all these particular program so this is the second part that we do on that account then he cuts the garments as per proper measurement to ensure great fitting so that is nothing but what we do auditing we pick up the right samples we pick up the right kind of cloth and we work on this particular thing on that account third one the next idea he does it is he stitches that seamlessly and trial he also tells you to come to for the trial at least twice so that there is a right kind of thing and that is what we do in our internal audit we create our draft reports and we keep on sending it and taking the responses from them again changing it and on that kind of things on that account and it doesn't stop there after that he you know he completes the thing and he hand finishes that garment and eventually give it to you which is nothing but final report and when it comes to that final report he surprises you by giving what i call he gives you some accessories he will give you some buttons he will give you some extra pocket or some watch pocket he will give it to you so all these kinds of thing he will add it on that is what we do by way of you know giving the executive summary and probably the action track and report action track you know atr so i think i always believe that we are more like the bespoke teller and if you learn these particular tricks of trade you will really come to the conclusion that you know you are almost giving what is needed on that account so now what it takes to decide what kind of suit i need to give it to the person so in that context there is a four level that you have to evaluate on that account and decide which is the best one to work on that particular part so first is you must know the company in which you are working now know your company is nothing but there will be different kind of companies you will work you will work for a probably a family run companies you may work for a professionally run companies professionally run companies then government organizations you may work for government departments you can work for or otherwise for you can also be in that regulated kind of companies that you will work where you know you are you know for instance central bank of uae will come to evaluate you like that it will happen so these are the four kinds of organizations accordingly you have to take different roles of an internal auditor that different an internal auditor of family run will be totally different from a you know internal audit and regulated space on that account similarly there are also different types of boards of the company today we have audit committee has become mandatory for all those companies which are quoted also same for uae and also for the bankers who require a separate you know boards as you know i don't know whether you guys have read the book there's a book book by ram charan called boards that deliver in that he says there are three kinds of boards that you have one of them is what i call the ceremonial board they that is where you know it is a literally very structured kind of board they create where i call them as a cookie directors you know they they are invited just well ahead of time their planning is also proper they will always you know either on a day earlier or day later there will be some program to attend some sort of a you know fashion show will be there some inauguration of a new product will be there so something like that so there are these are ceremonial boards where you will find more than substantial matters it is more on routine matters that will get addressed and in fact meetings will last for only one hour also sometimes it is less than that also so these are the ceremonial boards which are there then there is something called liberated boards and these are liberated in real sense because whatever you want to talk about as a board member they will allow you they will encourage you but eventually you will find that after talking too much only selected points will get picked up and those are what we call the liberated boards where you go and discuss people will listen to you and you will feel wow i have been heard i have been listened to but in reality not many points will get implemented at all on that account so this is the second kind of board you have and the third one which is which is the real crux and this is where the real internal auditor will get challenged is what i call the progressive boards 
progressive courts are where you can talk you can discuss a lot of points and they these things are taken up seriously and then they work on the action plans on that account so these are the three companies and three sets of boards you have so you have to decide when you are joining a company what kind of board you are you are certainly in one of those it could be a ceremonial board it could be a liberated board or it could even be a progressive board so accordingly you know you have to work in that typical kind of sphere on that account it doesn't stop there then you must know your audit committee members because this is where as an internal auditor you are supposed to report to audit committee very clearly on that account and in that you know you must know how much time these people spend i have seen some audit committees which are only happening for half an hour and i have seen some audit committees which also take place for half a day or number of time three four the per day so there are different companies different audit committee members they decide what kind of time sets that you want to do then what kind of attention span they have i have seen some people who are so glued to it they will get into all micro details from every audit and you will find somebody say open that page number 69 and that clause 4 why you have put it in this particular way so there are some you know audit committee members who will ask in such a great details also and at the same time i have seen some people to say oh i know you have given me so much of paper you tell me three important points which are very critical and let's discuss those particular things so you will also find a different kind of audit committee members on that basis and then you also probably know that some of that particular thing you know uh, that uh, what i should say whether they have read the agenda or not also you will know there are two kinds of people there people who have thoroughly read and they will tell you but you know you could have added x y z kind of thing and there are some people who say you know i could not read it because i was traveling because something else is happening so accordingly you have to decide what kind of reporting you have to do it could lead from an executive summary and it could even go up to detailed report or it could be best of both on that account and i have in my personal capacity i can tell you same company there are two different audit committee chair and somebody who was asking for so much of detail the next incoming chairman told me i don't think i want to get wasting my time on that you have to give me only five points in any committee meeting so that i will only spend time on that particular part so accordingly you have to also decide what kind of thing that you have to work on the thing it doesn't stop there then also the last point and this is what you have to do your own self evaluation as an internal auditor and which is very critical you know i have seen there are three kinds of internal auditor we have one is the person who is a very politically naive person he says i don't care i will say what i want to talk about it i am not afraid of anything so he becomes like a hot potato in overall kind of program he creates problem for himself also he creates problem for the management he can even create problems for the audit committee so that kind of person is there then there are two, second person who is on the other side what i call the politically inclined person who is you know will think about it before telling anything to audit committee how i will put it in what will my management guys will think about it then he will sometimes tell management guys to say i will do that in a filtered manner i will only talk about it so these are the politically inclined people and of course there are in between people who balance it out in a very structured fashion so i think you need to do your own evaluation and this is where you know as we rightly heard from our you know chief guest that tone at the top will decide what kind of internal auditor you will be on that account and that is where i always say based on these four things that is nothing but knowing the type of company whether it is you know promoter driven or otherwise the second part is what kind of board you have that we talked about that you know taking clue from ramcharan third one is based on audit committee and what kind of person you are you will be able to create what i call the survival checklist for survival kit of your own and accordingly design this particular part so i think i have linked that you know the bespoke tailoring to this particular point and accordingly you should know whether you are in the right company or not otherwise it becomes a misfit and it can create a lot of problems on that account so now i will go to the next point and which is very critical and i think in that regard i must say what are the desirable traits of a successful internal auditor 
And I think in that context, I was thinking, it's not that I have all these traits. In fact, I don't have it. But let me tell you, one of them is always a business and solution-oriented approach. I have seen some auditors saying that, you know, let me see how this, you know, business guy will report us. If I will ask this question, how we will do it in audit committee? I think that kind of attitude is bad. Rather than that, you should come out with a very clear idea that yes, there were problems, but we are addressing it together. I think that is how you create that positivity. It works very well. And I think in that context, positivity and friendliness is very, very critical to create what I call the win-win culture. Because, you know, creating animosity doesn't help. But I've seen a lot of internal auditors taking pleasure in creating that kind of animosity. In fact, so much so that I have seen one of those, I don't want to name the person, but one of the big reputed uh, group, their chief of internal auditor, whenever he would come for any IIA meeting, he would say, when I go for an audit, at least one person gets sacked. And I don't feel uncomfortable unless that sacking takes place. So if that kind of attitude you have and is an internal auditor, it can get into problems on that account. And I think internal audit will never be, you know, create a positivity around this particular thing on that account. Then third point, which is very critical is the person concerned should have enough patience. And I think this is where I'm saying you should be able to give a long rope to the business to see to it they are managing it well. And he should raise concerns only if he's unable to, you know, what I can't say, uh, uh, what I should say, he is absolutely business people are not listening. I require intervention from somebody, then only he interferes. Otherwise, he has that enough patience. And then one more thing that a mature internal auditor always knows, and this is something I always say, at the end of the chase game, you know, game of chase, the king, the queen, the rooks, the bishops, the knights, and even the pawns, whether you auditor would like to call him as bishops or you want to call it as a pawn, all of them go back in the same box. Eventually, all of you are part of the same employee fraternity. So you have to work together on that particular thing. So I think compared to that, you should not have that kind of attitude which will create that you are an outlier within your colleagues on that account. And that becomes a very critical kind of things on that account. And he should be very comfortable because in life, though we know we are all, you know, some of the people come with maths background, they feel one plus one is two, and which is a fact in maths. But in reality, there is always a black and white. And most of those problems that come in, they are all in grays. So we must have that ability to remain and be comfortable in those grades. At the same time, I'm not saying that you should not worry about your own limitations. And that is where I say you must create your own, you know, perimeter of your, you know, desired kind of ethics perimeter and desired kind of, uh, you know, your own conflict perimeters. And in that, you should not have compromises. So far, you are living within those grades and you do not barge and go beyond these perimeters defined by you on that account. And so far you are doing that, you are quite okay on that account. So these are some of the traits which I thought as an internal auditor, you must keep in mind that it's nothing like right or wrong solution. You have to work according to the organization that you have in that regard. So now having, you know, worked as chief internal auditor, then I have moved as director of many companies, and I am also chairman of audit committee on many companies. In fact, more than five companies, I am already a chair of audit committee. And in that, I am now on the other side as chair of audit committee sitting there. So I look like, you know, I don't know whether you heard Zubin Mehta. Zubin Mehta, have you heard? He's a great person who was, you know, organizing this particular uh, philharmonic orchestra. Have you heard of that person? He would come with a set of some hundred plus IPs, and they would come with each of them would come with two, three instruments. And it is a big thing through which he will create a melodious and synchronized kind of orchestra on that account. So I think when you are a chair of audit committee, you have to do that job of Zubin Mehta, where you have to conduct everything in a very structured kind of fashion. You have so many people reporting to you. Internal audit department comes and talks statutory auditors or external auditors, they come and speak to you. Compliance people make their uh, you know, uh, presentations. Surveillance or whistleblowing people, 
they come in and talk to you on that account. The business people, when they have challenges, they come and talk to you. Then CFO manages the funds, he deals with the banking and financial institutions. He has to come and talk to you because he also has a connect with probably internal audit and stat audit. And CEO also number of times you invite him into the audit committees on that account. And last but not least is regulator. Once in a year, they will come and meet up with you as a chair of audit committee. And one more piece which is getting added or which probably will start happening to you is even credit rating agencies are meeting chair of audit committees as a matter of compulsory meetings which is required on that account. And I think then by virtue of that, for a person who is a chair of audit committee or for audit committee to get that overall management assurance, it becomes more like a jigsaw puzzle of all these eight or nine people to whom you have to see to it that you beat around and create and solve that jigsaw puzzle so it becomes a very right kind of you know management assurance framework of course in that also you will see some overlaps or you will see some cracks happening on those things you have to manage in a very delicate fashion to see to it that it all works very well on that account so i think these are the three important points that i talked about there are some typical other inputs that i learned hard way which i thought i will share with you on that account one of them is every time you need to look at your adequacy of your internal audit function. Now, what is what do you mean by uh, you know adequacy? You have to keep on reviewing your organizational chart. You have to look at your number of people. You have to look at your skill sets. You have to look at what kind of you know uh, I would say IT savviness that you are building around this particular thing. What kind of automation you bring in? Can you do a lot of digitalization of that account? And also. Do you create the right kind of movement of the people? Because I always believe somebody who does a typical audit for more than two or three years will start losing that typical, I would say, sensitivity around that particular part. So you have to keep on changing people on that account. So you should see to that that you do that on a proactive basis. Then you have to create. I, in India, it is mandatory to have one-on-one -on -one meeting with your chair of audit committee and audit committee. I think these are some of the great opportunities where you have to create the right kind of, I would say, you, this is the time to create emotional bonds with the audit committee. So what kind of agenda you have to put forward, you have to start thinking on that account to see to it that you certainly get the work done from them and at the same time understand from them whether you are on the right track as far as they are concerned and what best they would like you to do on that account. Another one is oversight on subsidiaries, which is very critical. In our Tata Portus, we had a good practice. We, once in a year, we would invite all our subsidiaries, which included even Jaguar Land Rover of UK, to come and talk about their own, I would say, audit committee related part and management assurance framework. And that was a real great kind of framework that you must work on that particular part. It doesn't stop there. Then you have to come out with significant findings which are more in, you know, rather than giving entirely thing, you have to give ABC kind of observations, look on A kind of observations more than anything else, and see to it that the time between actually your examination and reports are really very short. Otherwise, that crispiness of that will go off. You have to also see to it that whistleblowing mechanism and fraud investigation is carried out simultaneously. So if you don't do it, it's fine but it has to be carried out in consultation or in alignment with you people, which is also very critical. And I don't know whether it's happening in UAE or not, but in India, now recruitments of chief internal auditor, he exists and also his performance valuation is looked after by audit committee. So indirectly it is, you know, I would say kept as a one more way of keeping away from the management your own independence on that account. So this is something you can work on this particular part, which is very clearly thing. And I really don't know whether for, you know, these bankers, internal audit, you can do that. But in other part, there is something called value add, which is nothing but, you know, not just preservance of the values, but value add, you can start looking at it. And in that context, these three lines of defense, now you call it, we are no more calling it three lines of defense under IIA, they call it three lines model where even an auditor can get into the level two work or even level one work if required. So far, he's not creating conflict on that account. Now, time has come for us to start 
looking out for that kind of work that could be like new product development it could be like user acceptance test it could be due diligence when you are acquiring a new unit that is where internal auditors can really work on that particular part very well on that account also getting associated with the risk management can be looked at so i think these are some of the things that people are looking at it and quality assurance and which i think you people have that mandatory thing with, you know uh, with cb ua that once every 5 years you have to get an outside agency on that account and i always say two times you should do it for sure if you are taking on a chief internal auditor in that year itself you must carry out this work so that if there is some carry forward it belongs to your earlier predecessor and similarly when you are leaving a year before see to it that you carry out this exercise so that the next guy who comes in does not use those deficiencies to his advantage on that account so these are the two three things that i will talk about it and i think with that i must say uh, i would like to say that these are some of the learnings that i have learned on my internal audit related part now if so then, do you think i can spend 5 or 8 minutes more or i am running short on time i so would you, like to know uh, secretary sir yeah yeah i think you can carry on sir no issue yeah yeah okay. thank you so i then i will i will having talked about this particular part i think somebody has raised voice i mean raised hands rajiv yeah uh, rajiv meera sir yeah you want something yeah yeah i will take him on uh, maybe or you want to first uh, finish 5 minutes and then i take him yeah. to the qna yeah. yeah i think that is a good that's a good point i yeah. think uh, last one and a half year has been a very different kind of time for us unprecedented times i think i am at the age of 62 i am also experiencing it for the first time but most of you are youngsters so probably you have still more 10 to 15 years further to go of your productive life i think now the way things are happening the work from home culture my feeling is it will become a new normal i think just now i heard kpmg uk for instance they have already announced that every two weeks you have to come only four days in a week and that too you don't come just for it you have to go when there is some collaborative work that means they are you know there is there your group is getting together or something like training is there that is the time you should come in otherwise you stay at home and work from that particular part similarly sales force guys have said in fact they have classified that into three different kind of units there is something called flex group flex working group there is something called fully remote group and there is something called office based group office based group is going to be very small which will probably come four days in a week remaining people like flex work will work only one or two days in a week like that and there are some typical fully remote guys who will not even come to the office at all because they can do their work sitting at home kind of thing so i think now time is come to stay do you think how internal audit will shape up on that account and i think there are some groups like twitter microsoft and even companies like the germany siemens they have already announced that we are going to be consistently working on only what i call the uh, work from home culture on that account so how we are really going to do that will become a very critical kind of perspective we have to look at it from that kind of side so i think this is a very critical point so i want to understand you know uh, are we really you know uh, digitalization plan whatever that we have probably 5 years down the road or 7 years down the road i think time has come for us to see to it that it, i can it has to be done in next one years time so that is work from home remote audit is possible on that account so i think in that then there will be challenges for your work from home clear things such as quality how you will monitor quality how you will monitor how will you track time sheets what time the person logs in you will have to start monitoring that particular part then you have to develop the skills of project monitoring skills because our audits are nothing but projects you have to monitor that sitting in your houses how you will do it becomes a very important point how you will deal with your examinees that is your auditees or your business people also will become an important point and another point which came up and i was in one of those typical big it enabled service company of india i was called to talk about it in that regard their biggest challenge is you now you should know your employee is working with who he is staying with who who are his neighbors so i think your extended family of your employee has started getting important because they realize 
that some of those friends were staying as you know uh, PGs together in one flat. Four people were staying together, and all four are part of the important assignment related work they get. Marketing guys, and all of them are competitors in each way in that particular thing. In house they stay together, but they are working for four different IT enabled service companies. Now it is not illegal. But now these kind of extended work you have to find out, and that will be more part of your job on that particular thing. Another one which has happened, and I think all of us have done that, we have started our reliance more on CISO or CTO because we are sitting at home. If there is something that we want to do, such as you know endpoint security, we are relying on them. We we'll just take their particular thing as saying you know is it protected or not? If he says yes, you will take it on that account. There is no way we can check that thing now. There are lot of things. Records are getting, you know, updations through backending kind of thing that is happening because you know people are not coming in. Then lot of those scanning which is happening, one doesn't know what kind of scans are happening. Apparently, there are some surveys where it is said that 45% of the scan number of times are forged documents on that account. Then you have to look at segregation of duties now in a different kind of perspective. Then denial of services are happening, which are nothing but like a ransomware that are happening in rampant in India. So how we will deal with it will become an important point. And last but not least, we think a lot of frauds are happening where the CTOs and IT departments people are getting together with HR to give out your data. So data safety, how you will really protect, has become a very important point. Another one, which is the typical grey areas, which are very, very, I would say, blind spots, as I would like to call it, procurement. I am not sure in the last 14 months or 15 months have we invariably given all our assignments to L1 guys. I think most of the people are telling us, you know, we will not get delivery in time, so we have decided to forego L1. So I think if we are going to have those kind of problems, how do we look at the genuinity of that particular thing? So a lot of new new audit related challenges will come up. Branches which were anyway problematic now, if you guys can't guys can't reach, do you have a nearby agency who can do it for you? Like for instance, some agencies like we had some plans somewhere in Coimbatore, somewhere in the thing. We managed to get the local chartered accountant firms to help us out in that regard. So how you train them on the you know on the you know work from home becomes a challenge on that account. Then outsource agencies, how you will monitor when you can't monitor your own people? How you will monitor outsource agencies also become a tough time kind of thing. Financial integrities is becoming a problem. Typical one like stock valuations, physical asset verification. Then you know stock in transit. Cut off times when you are really cut off your annual report becomes a big challenge on that account. Re recoveries, receivables, the confirmations, it could be all the big challenges on that particular part. Doesn't stop there. The mis-selling of insurance and broking and banking related part. Today, under the you know the emotional bond of you know deaths that are happening, insurance policies are sold by the by big number on that account. Do you think it will really cover right kind of risk on the side of the insured? And at the same time, do you think insurance companies will they be inundated with the problems of you know one year within the one year kind of claims will become a big kind of problems on that account? So I think these are some of the new challenges that you guys have to get ready in that particular regard. So I think with that, I would like to say some typical thing and not more than four minutes or three minutes. I have picked up, you know, there are a lot of learns, lessons that we have learned, I believe, from COVID-19, which as an internal auditor we can use. You know, we have learned, keep safe distance and wear mask. I think that is where I am saying, that is where you have to learn remote audit now. So you are keeping the safe distance away. And at the same time, you are trying to automize as much as possible. So this is one part. Mask indirectly means talk less, hear more. I think that's what we heard. And also at the same time, you have two hands. So write with both hands and create a report. Don't create too much of the thing because most of the auditors spoil the show by talking wrong things at the wrong time. So I think this is where mask technology will really help us on that account. Third one is we are like a frontline health worker. So you, uh, you need to have two kinds of audit plan. One is a regular audit plan. And another one is like creating a special board where you will treat them separately. So you are like a health line worker. So you have to create 
this thing there is an audit plan for regular one there is an audit plan for specially for this covid related part that's why we talked about black spots you know how you will take care in the in this interim you have to look, look at that particular thing it doesn't stop there then you have enough doctors in the hospital like that you should have subject matter experts from your side you should have medicines and oxygen which is like for you it's at your own tools and dashboards so you know you have to keep on replenishing that particular point then you also require good paramedics which is our rookies the new guys that you have to recruit and you have to train them on that account so this is again a big challenge that we have learned on that account you have to increase your diagnostic tests and this is where you know you have to increase your frequency and intensity of audits so i think the lot of learnings are coming on that account we are told create positivity i think this is a eternal exercise for us when we go and discuss the matter you should come out happy even the party also should be happy saying that yes a lot of value addition has happened so that creating that positivity is very critical and then we are typical indian guys you know we believe in alternate medicine so create like i told you in coimbatore i had created a chartered accountant firm create an alternate kind of things on that count this is something which is important enhance immunity which is nothing but you know a fresh dose of trainings and learning that we have to go through so this is like how you create immunity for using job on that account and last but not least you know organize vaccination and vaccination is nothing but ensure organization gives fresh dose of ethics code of conduct is again being retrained to people on that account communication of do's and don'ts during this time and use of hotlines for this you know this whistle blowing related part is also very critical so i thought these are some of the learnings equivalent of covid 19 for our internal auditors with that i would like to conclude i am happy to take answers i am also happy to stay if you want at later stage also i can do so i will be very happy to take up sessions got a question the way you want so thank you once again for giving me an opportunity it was a great pleasure so i am waiting for you people to give me instructions accordingly uh thank you very much uh, c n nagesh pinge ji uh, for addressing our members on internal audit and uh, you highlighted uh, the concept of bespoke suit and uh, and you correlated with internal audit you also spoke about uh, jubin mehta connecting and synchronizing the music with hundreds of musicians and then at the end you correlated with uh, covid safety protocols the internal audit uh, methodologies is amazing sir thank you very much and uh, now i request our ex com member ca jayprakash agarwal to manage the q and a session with you and members over to you thank you arisha thanks a lot sir you you heard about oceans right your knowledge is you heard about oceans your knowledge is ocean and we have only taken a glass of water from that i love the way you have linked chess boards and pawns and queens going into the same deck after the after the game and the way you related covid i can see faces cameras coming on when you were relating covid with internal audit it was amazing session i loved it one at a time it was some takeaways there with this i will first go with one of our uh, i mean one of our members who want to ask a question rajiv you raise your hand in between we'll give you the first chance to ask the question sir please go ahead and ask your question sir thanks sir for this opportunity nagesh sir it was an amazing to hear from you you used lot of analogies and we loved that analogy so i'll just pick up one analogy which you used on the on the dress side so normally we go to the internal auditor for getting a wedding suit but lot of time we get a ppe kit out of that so that's that's where it comes into so i'm just connecting your analogy back to the discussion my my biggest point which from an internal audit perspective comes uh, i i'm being into that uh, internal auditor function also so i understand the pain values in that side normally which you, if you find the errors it is said that you are just finding the dot on a i and a dash on a t you're not bringing something bigger and if you bring something bigger your voices are being being thrashed out and and that's where uh, the speak up policy and other things also also gets carried out so that's where we want to know from you how to put a balance in that because if you keep talking the the normal things everyone is happy but if you bring something which is very different and we have seen i am not blaming any internal auditor because i am being part of that function also a lot of times in my career so when the things blow completely wrong that's a time the internal auditor is being questioned why you have not identified this where it is it was definitely there in some of the risk register and being tracked so so back to you sir yeah no i think i tell you uh, you know if let's say uh, most of us are indians here so let me tell you we are all used to staying in a big uh, you know uh, huf family 
where you have four uncles, you know, uh, maybe, uh, you know, six, seven siblings, uh, not yours, means cousins, first cousins kind of thing, all of us are staying together. It's not that all of us come with the same kind of attitude, same kind of level, same kind of, you know, probably expectations kind of thing. We had to create win-win situations. I think in that context, you, I, I do that. In, in, a, in, a, in a business, I classify the business head in some typical way. Sharif banda hai, ganda banda hai, or beach wala banda hai. So I think you have to understand on that basis. You have to deal with all those people accordingly on that account. That is one. Number two, it is not that you can kill somebody immediately because after all, he's a part of your relative. That's the way I put it across, your own colleague. So can I give him a right attitude or guy right way to justify his own kind of whatever wrong that he has done? So if you give that kind of thing, the guy understands that boss, he understands my constraints, he understands my challenges. So he starts appreciating it, he starts listening to you on that count. So this is how you start creating a mentor for yourself. I think what happens is at our level, you know, sometimes the rush, blood of rush, you know, the rush of blood which comes in, we then tend to get into one-to-one -one kind of two-to-my-my -my -my kind of attitude comes in. So I think get out of that idea is to solve the problem rather than the solving the attitude problem of that person. Unless the person really does it in a big way, then that is where you, you take help and that is where one-to-one -one, this mentoring sessions happens with your audit committee. You can probably request that if you can also help us out, it helps. So that kind of thing, if you do, it becomes more a solution orientation comes in. I have done that. I mind you, I worked in ICICI Bank. Most of the colleagues at that time are today running the insurance companies, all these, you know, AMCs and all. They were all aggressive guys. Today, you won't believe all of them keep in touch with me for whatever it is because they think, you know, he is a tough bastard. That is the way they were using it. But at the same time, he understands the business. So today, most of these people have called and getting me into that particular thing. For instance, somebody who is the uh, you know uh, CEO of a largest NPFC has invited me to join his insurance company board because he I used to fight with him around that time. But that fighting was healthy fighting, not the bad fighting for the points, not as an individual. I think so far we are in a position to distinguish these two. It will work well. Yes, sir. We have seen you from ICSA days also. You must remember. You must have remembered P50 projects. So. Yes. <laughs> so that's what. Back to you, Jay. Thank you. Sir. Yeah. Thank you, Rajiv. Thanks a lot, sir. We'll go with the next question. Uh, this question is coming from. He pinged me the initial moment when we started uh, the session. He said, "Jay, I want to ask a question." So, Anil, sir, over to you. Please go ahead and ask your question. I have already given you the power to unmute. Yes, sir. Please go ahead. See, I'm meeting my boss after how many years? Okay, almost uh, 10 years. Okay. He was my boss in Reliance. Okay. And I worked with him. And uh, basically, I would like to uh, tell you where is cricket today? You have not really used any example of cricket. Otherwise, you always really complete a meeting without a cricket uh, analogy. You cannot have a meeting with Nagesh being an opening batsman in uh, university. And um, a 2020 fan now, uh, and his uh, speaking speed has gone up that much that uh, it is uh, 2020 we are hearing now. Okay, he was very slow in speaking, giving you good analogies and everything. Sir, anyway, I should ask you a question because that is what I have asked. I, I cannot take more time of you, sir. Value added um, um, audit that's what you are always releasing. Value addition comes, there should be a cost also, cost of audit. Uh, it is uh, not people's cost alone. Um, the cost of waiting for your report is also there. How is it really, uh, coming uh, helping uh, us? And how we will assess it, cost of audit to result? How we will do it, sir? I think, uh, I think we always believe, and I think we have learned this very hard way in our organization that we're working together. I think you should keep your per hour cost of your employee ready. Whether you are in, you know, I mean, professional people will invariably, they have to bill people. So they will accordingly keep that particular part. But frankly speaking, you must keep some sort of a costing on that account number one. At the same time, you have to also see to it that you are really doing value addition for the other party. And this is where seeking budget, there is one way to seek budget from audit committee. 
I think you should also get into a good practice of seeking budget from your business guys. If you do that, you know, they will a joint responsibility comes in. It is not that for all you will get that particular part, but you have to do that particular thing. So I think in that context, if you start creating that kind of attitude to say we will work together on any assignments, this value addition will start coming in. And they will also start using your people as a matter of right because it becomes a part of their costing. And since having allocated the budget, it's a win-win situation. Because if you are involved in their, you know, new projects coming in you also get to know ins and out of that system very easily on that account. So your trading cost will go down and you will get that, that kind of cost from your business indirectly on that account. So come out with your own ways of looking at these kind of resources that works brilliant. And I think it's not far off. In India, it is happening also a number of times. If somebody says, I want this, auditors are on their own sending their own team to help them out in that regard. So they become a replacement for some of the external people on that account. That has happened in one of the companies where I was an advisor after my retirement, the airport where I was working. I think we have done that particular part where we decided to give our own people from risk management to help them that particular thing out. By virtue of the cost went down very smoothly. So come out with news. I remember you were, you were deputing us to improve the SOPs in our recent place. Thank yes. you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you okay, Thanks perfect. a lot. Sir, two, one question and one request. Because Anil, Anil has already said that you drink cricket. I want to hear that cricket piece of it uh, wherever you want to bring in. And I, I will also give you a question which, which has, someone has posted here. He says, is internal audit responsible for fraud? If fraud takes place, is internal audit responsible for it? As in, what is the level of responsibility of audit in detecting fraud? So whether they have to be very uh, alert in terms of fraud or it's not their primary responsibility? Good question. I think uh, one thing I can tell you, there is an attitude difference when you go to look out for a fraud and when you don't, when you go as an ordinary internal auditor. And I always believe a good internal auditor should have basic faith in people. But if you are going for fraud investigation, you start believing nothing is wrong and nothing is correct there and everything is wrong in that particular part. So that attitude problem sometimes create problems. So even if let's say the function of, uh, you know, coming out with audit, I mean, with fraud is given to the audit team, a best chief internal auditor will have create a separate team, which will look at it rather than each and every, uh, you know, internal auditor working on that particular part. And I think working on fraud is more a different job from an internal audit perspective. So even if you want to overlook it and you want to take on the responsibility, you need to create a separate team, separate kind of attitude and separate kind of technology for that particular thing. Because how you will interview a person is different. How you will deal with the businessman as an internal auditor is different. So you can't mix it up. And at lower level, it becomes a problem for that maturity is not there to that extent. So they should not behave like a fraud investigator in internal audit, which is a problem, and they should not become an ordinary internal auditor in fraud investigation. You are getting the perspective. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Now on cricket, I will tell you one thing. I don't want to get into that particular thing, but I think I put it across. Whether you look at 2020, whether you look at one day international or you look at uh, even test cricket for that matter, I don't know how much of you realize it in the initial phase. People who play into the V are the ones who score the highest on that account. After that, you start looking at the, you know, start, start looking at the ball, then you know the movements, you know who kind of dealers, how much turn is happening. Then you start playing with those, you know, heli helicopter shops and the other kind of shops on that account. So please understand, even for an auditor, I think when you are going there, you must play within V first. And then after that particular part, you know, probably know the other side very well. Then you can start taking those kind of chances. So I think that's how I will link my cricket with the internal audit. I love the analogy you bring to the table. It helps us to relate to it and remember it. With this, we'll go yeah. to next question. Sarik has requested a couple of times. I want to ask a question. Sarik, go ahead. Ask your question. Yes. Uh, sir, uh, first of all, I'd like to say it's a terrific presentation. I um, in this profile and I've heard many of the presentation uh, people in this area, but this was a terrific presentation and I'm really agree with uh, many uh, audience who are saying that we need more from you. 
it's a huge learning and you know i was going through very i was very attentive to the entire session when you started speaking so i really thank you for the great presentation and sharing your experience with us so coming to the question i want to ask is uh answer one thing one thing i want to appreciate you know at this age you are having so much of passion so please tell us about that as well so sir to ask i, I want to you know ask the question uh, sir like what we follow the basic of the con conventional approach of the audit we start with the program the plan the rcm which we say risk control matrix then we do the field audit we do, do the testing we find the issues we had the fights and we agree on the issues and then we uh, draft the uh, uh, issues which we have agreed then the report comes then the meeting with the audit and then the uh, committee or the board of members i just cut short uh, just to save time of the uh, all the members so i want to know this consumes a lot of time and time has a cost so sir don't you think at this present era we need to find a way or we need to you know cut down the steps because if you see the content of program or audit program or plan rcm are not much uh, uh, independent they are somehow linked to each other and it's a version of the documents which i see in, i don't know how far i am able to connect but this how i see it is it is going to be a time consuming task which i can see and and the fruitfulness has reduced because of the high tech because in the era we are right now so so don't you think at this time we need to move from the conventional method of auditing to the high tech eras where we can reduce time in the documentation basically it's a hell lot of time consuming documentation i think uh, mr mohammed you are right raising a right questions on that account and this is where i think time has come for us to really think through our digitalization plan basically like for instance i don't want to talk too much about it i will just show you i have created my own uh, you know handwritten note for today's presentation on that account then i have created that on ipad on that account by writing using my you know a typical uh, apple uh, you know this i pencil on that account now this will go as my record into my email that's it so now if you want an organization can always look at what kind of i would say proxies are allowed as documentary evidence and i think in that context you people only will have to say can i become totally paperless can i become totally digitalized and i think today the time has come for us to work on this particular thing on a very proactive manner so time has come for us to look at this new digitalization rather than you know saying we have a problem we will work out but one thing i can tell you you can't get away from documentary evidence because that is the only thing which keeps you eventually safe at later stage so i think considering that nobody will say you destroy your papers on that account but you can create a digital paper very easily on that account and at the same time your rcm and all i also respect your thing this is where rcms can you shorten it is what you have to look at it and i think in that context you know in our uh, office thing there is something called ca uh, you know this uh, uh, 6x program you know this uh, this uh, how to cut down on your uh, mess that you create and how you can cut down on your paperwork i think you have to start using those kind of philosophy to see how i can reduce my work and it's possible to do that there are a lot of softwares which are available by virtue of that you know you can just finish it off this very clear so work towards that and these are professional ex i mean some excellence business excellence initiatives you have to get it when i was in icsi i used to have 300 400 people i would respect and we would give some award once in a month for one brilliant idea that comes from one great internal auditor it can be from any side it can reduce work it can work our efficiency or it could mean some new point that has come in i would i would recommend that guy to get some sort of a thing at that time we were giving him some good book or some subscription to something or sometimes even subsidizing cost of one of the course that he will do on that account. so that's how we were doing it so it was more a proactive way so start thinking it will go thank you thank you sari for asking that question uh, sir i loved it there are multiple questions coming in but in interest of time since uh, i will request if you will be around we will uh, take those I questions will. sir yeah. you talk about cricket and you also see movies not much not much you heard movies like a uh, movie is a hit or a super hit or a blockbuster right no, i am not frankly i don't see so much of movies basically okay unfortunately so, no 
Okay, so for me, it was a blockbuster session, sir. I mean, blockbuster is something yeah. out of the box. Yeah. People loved yes. it. I can see faces smiling there across all the speaker, all the participants who are attending. My pleasure. My Thanks pleasure. a lot for this. Hand over yes. to Hari, sir. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you very much, Jay, uh, for managing Q and A session. Uh, now I request. Uh, I think Nagesi. There are so yes. many messages pouring from our members appreciating your presentation. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much, sir, for a great presentation. And uh, now I request our chairman, CA Sundar Nurani, to present certificate of appreciation to CA Nagesh Pinge. Thank you, Nagesh, sir. A very, uh, a very beautiful presentation. It is as if, you know, we have seen a movie slowly and coming out uh, very, very, very nice way. And uh, uh, when he told me that I don't want PowerPoint, I was wondering uh, what kind of story you are going to tell. But I think I can call you as uh, the chief storyteller. Very, 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 very nice Thank way you. of presenting. Thank, Thank you very much, sir. We yeah. appreciate yeah. your support. And Thank if you, you want, I can, I'm willing to stay put here. I'm comfortable. So I can do that if you want. I can Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you very much, sir. And uh, yes. I will uh, email you this uh, certificate of appreciation. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Hari, Hari, I want Thank to you. just mention one story. In fact, yeah. uh, when we posted the uh, event uh, in the LinkedIn, uh, there was a last minute uh, uh, correction made. In, in, in fact, uh, our media team wanted to enlarge the photo of uh, Mr. Nagesh. So what happened? His name got conceived. Whereas all yeah. other speakers, they had their name. But in the case of Mr. Na Mr. Nagesh, name was not there. Nobody picked it up. I reviewed it. I mean, it was it, 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 the correction was made after our reviews. So obviously, yeah. we won't be able to find out. But nobody right. pointed out. The only person who pointed out was uh, Mr. Nagesh. And he was telling me that uh, internal auditors are quite good in pointing out those things which will be never pointed out by anyone. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman, sir. Thank you. Uh, now, our next session is... Uh, with, with the speaker, CA KS Ramakrishnan. And uh, to introduce him, I will request our XCOM member, CA Manoharan Pallarichal, to introduce. Uh, Manu, yeah. you are there. Over to you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Hare Krishna, sir. Thank you. Uh, Sanjay, what a wonderful uh, session we had. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Nagesh, sir. It was very interesting. And now, another session. Our next speaker is CAKS Ramakrishnan, the Chief Risk Officer at Iraq Bank. Mr. Ram has over 37 years of banking experience. Wow. In various roles covering operations, corporate banking, retail banking, audit, and credit risk control in multiple geographical locations such as India, Indonesia, Singapore, and the Middle East. He joined RAG Bank in 2009 as head of internal audit and moved to the role of chief risk officer in 2016. Currently, he manages all the risk management functions of RAG Bank, including credit risk, market risk, operational risk, information security, fraud risk management, and internal controls. Mr. Ram is a fellow member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India, graduate of the Institute of Cost and Works Accountants of India, that is ICWAI, and certified information system auditor, PISA from USA. Of course, he is a member of our chapter, that is IC Dubai chapter. Please help me to welcome CA Ramakrishnan to hear from him on the topic risk management, a very relevant topic at this point of time. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much, uh, Ramadan Karim, everyone. Uh, I have got a very difficult act to follow because I could see from the chats the amount of uh, appreciation for the earlier speaker. But anyway, uh, let me start off thanking the ICA Dubai chapter and uh, Chairman Sundar Noorni for inviting me. I'm pretty humbled to be talking to all of you and I see a tremendous response to this uh, particular webinar and uh, that makes me all the more responsible. Um, uh, thank you so much. Can I, can I share my screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Oh, 
Okay. Uh, I hope everyone can see my screen. Yes, yes, it's visible yeah. sir, okay. very clearly. Basically, uh, what I want to talk about is is not so much about one on one and risk management, which people all, I'm sure, all of us are chartered accountant. We have learned in our professional lives, etc. I just want to talk about the new emerging risks avenues in not only just in well, I call it financial services because that's the industry I've been associated with the last uh, three plus decades. Uh, but I think this is something which is uh, engulfing all of us, whichever industry we are, uh, it doesn't matter. So, and, and, and I thought that uh, I will speak to you about the new emerging challenges in the risk management function. Uh, and of course, with that, the changing role of uh, chief risk officers. Basically, I also wanted to give a few approaches, how we deal with these new challenges and what are the skill sets that are required. Of course, there could be various ways that you can approach how do you handle new challenges. This is one approach, and I, and I do not in any way claim that this is the best approach. Everyone has got their own way of doing it, but I hope you get some uh, tips from this, and, and maybe this is one of the approaches, the approaches that I have followed, and perhaps uh, that's something that uh, with will be useful to all of you. Uh, yeah, let me start out with a disclaimer. The views of these uh, express is all mine. It's not of an em my employer, because uh, I just want to be very clear about that. So I start off with that disclaimer. But uh, talking about risk management, this is what I was talking about. I mean, earlier, when you talk of risks in financial services, particularly, people talk, people talk of credit risk, market risk, operational risk, and perhaps a little bit of reputation risk or cross-border risk. But today, the landscape has changed. You look at it today, I mean, if you look at risk management, we have learned a lot more new vocabulary, data localization, data privacy, uh, cyber risk, um, you know, I don't know, uh, and thanks to COVID, pandemic, pandemic preparedness, and so on and so on. Basically, what has happened is the role of, uh, of risk managers has expanded horizontally, you know, not only it's expanded uh, deep, it is also expanded from a breadth point of view. Traditionally, if you look at uh, any, I mean, financial services for that matter, people talk about like what I said, credit market operational cross-border risk, but look at it, what is emerging now? I mean, it's IT risk, which is, you know, uh, basically information security, pandemic preparedness, new operating model, as our uh, previous speaker pointed out, this new operating model is all fantastic. People working at home, uh, you know, all of us have, have, uh, have faced this, but whenever I heard about this new operating model, whatever, my risk management antenna goes up. You know, there are new risks which come up with this new operating model, no question about it. And uh, digitalization is all fantastic. Then what happens to data localization, data privacy? These are all the new risks that come up with that. And we, are, we also mentioned about, I mean, there are a few discussions on fraud. There, you know, fraud is, uh, is uh, fraud management is, or uh, fraud uh, investigation is part of audit, et cetera. But one thing is sure, fraud is inevitable. Fraud is inevitable. And what is also uh, interesting is that fraud is also changing its colors. We are moving away from, I mean, hopefully moving away from traditional frauds also into, into cyber crime. So if you look at it, all in all, there is, there is huge, huge change in the risks which are emerging. And the, the, the risk landscape is of course changing. So that is something that I would like, like to talk to you about and say, how do we, how do we approach these new risks while at the same time managing the earlier risk. I mean, talking about analogy, I know uh, people like a lot of the analogy used by the previous speaker, but this is one analogy I always use when talking about uh, traditional risk versus emerging risk. Essentially, if you say risk is a disease, the traditional risk are basically like cancer. Credit risk, market risk, operational risk are cancer. It'll kill you, it'll eat you slowly, it'll take its own time, but if you have detected on time, taken properly all precautions, perhaps there is a chance, chance of survival. The new risk, IT risk, cyber crime, fraud, they are cardiac arrest. It'll, it could happen at the time when you least expect it and next minute you're gone. 
So this is this is the issue. I mean, the thing is, until of course, can you identify? Yeah, I mean, the the only way you can identify is to doing all the preventive checks in advance. That way you can stop a cardiac arrest. But when you get a cardiac arrest, you're, you're almost instantaneously gone. So this is a big difference between the traditional risk and the emerging risk. And which is why it is very, very important as risk managers, chief risk officers, people need to be cognizant of all these new risks and how do we manage them? Uh, I mean, ideally, yes. How do we anticipate them? How do we manage them is very, very important. But also it is, it is also important to see what can we do about all these risks and what approach can we take in, a, in, an, in an organization to be able to manage these. Like what I mentioned, chief risk officers traditionally focused on credit operational market risk, but whereas the need today is a lot more, as you can see, there are, the, there are basically risk bulbs from all over the place. So you, you get into the sp spotlight multiple times, not necessarily from your, uh, your, your traditional risk. Um, the, what does it mean is that the, the role of chief risk officer is changing. Uh, the chief risk officer, not only the chief risk officer, his own entire management team need to learn new risk. When I say role is changing, what does it mean? Does it mean that suddenly it became from a second line of defense into a first line of defense or third line? It's not that. It is just that it is just that the role complete, the breadth of the role enhances significantly. So not only is walking a tight rope. Now he's been given a lot of burdens and weights to handle as well. So essentially what it means is that uh, the chief risk officer, if at all, he had a uh, few sleepless nights, he'll have a lot more of that these days. Uh, I mean, <laughs> that, that's all I can say. But but how do we manage that? Is there, a, is there a method to the madness in which how do we can manage these? Yes, of course, there are, there are a few tricks in the trade. And maybe I can share some of these. And like what I said, I would like to hear the members' comments. Uh, or on a lot more. I'm sure there are a lot more ways of handling it, but it's just that I just thought uh, maybe I'll share a few of my experiences, how we manage these new risks. Uh, like what I mentioned, uh, cybercrime, IT risk, fraud risk, reputation risk, regulatory compliance. I mean, rep reputation risk comes twice, but uh, yeah, basically it's huge, I guess. Uh, and and regulatory compliance also is, is, is while you could have a chief compliance officer who is different from a chief risk officer. The, you know, the, the, the central bank in the country or, or even the regulators look to the CRO to manage compliance risks as well. You may not be managing compliance, but you need to manage compliance risk. Essentially, risk taking is, should be different from the risk management. Risk management is the business of risk officers. And again, here, there is no business no activity, in fact, I would say that uh, where risk is not involved. You want to cross a road, there is a risk in crossing the road. You need to make sure that you need to look at this side, look at this side, there's nobody there, there's a green light. Even if there's a green light, it doesn't mean that you can, you can just like that cross the road because you could have one driver who has lost his balance and coming out. So you need to, you need to watch out. Uh, even, let, let's put it this way, as simple task as organizing this presentation uh, or, or this event by, by ICA Dubai has its own risk. What happens if the, if the participant or if the speaker doesn't turn up for the event? What happens if the speaker's presentation is not heard? What happens if his voice breaks? You know, I mean, you look at it, everything in this world has got risk, essentially. And managing these risks is the business of risk managers. So essentially, what is important is that we need, we need to leave it to professionals to manage the risk. And like what I mentioned, basically, uh, it, 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 is an, it is a very, very important way of looking at it. I mean, like what uh, I, I was quite interested with the previous, uh, previous uh, presentation where he did mention that uh, a trick I always believe because I was, I, I was an ex-head of internal audit as well. The trick of a good internal auditor or the test of a good internal auditor is not just giving findings, but also giving what is the right recommendations for the findings. That is very important because like what I said, risks are there, so you know you need to manage the risk. How do you manage the risk? That's the issue. And it's a very, very difficult uh, task, believe me. Uh, again, if you look at an analogy here, if, if running a business is like a car, what, which part is risk management? 
risk management to me is the brakes. You know, somebody will say the brakes are there to stop the car. I'm sorry. In my view, brakes are there not to stop the car. Brakes are there to help the car, car to go faster. Somebody may think, uh, what is this guy talking? You know, I mean, I thought brakes are there. If I slam on the brake, the car will stop. Just give a car to somebody uh, and tell him you just drive very fast. I'm just giving you one piece of information. There's no brakes in the car. Just imagine how the car will be driven. Definitely nobody in their, in their sane mind will drive a car fast without the brakes in it. So the brakes are basically the risk management function. It is difficult simply because when you, when you, and risk by definition means it's not an incident. It's not, it's not something that has happened. And it's, it is an possibility that something may happen. And that's what becomes very difficult because when you tell somebody that this may happen and we need to take all these precautions, uh, you could have a few management guys or sales guys to come and tell you, oh, by the way, Ram, this has never happened in the bank. So why are we doing all these things? You are just stopping, stopping things. It has, if it has already happened, it's no longer a risk, it's an event. So what then that is where I think it is very important to make sure that we have these particular approaches in managing risk in, in, in any organization. Uh, I just put in here four, um, four kind of blocks basically to go through. One is of course structure, the definition, and basically that uh, there is no one silver bullet to manage the risk and, and have a balanced approach. Uh, on, on structure, it is absolutely important that we have a right structure and then the risk management function. What does it require? It, it absolutely important, the risk management is independent of, of the management function. And interestingly, as far as uh, banks and financial organizations are concerned in UAE, Central Bank has issued regulations on risk management, which makes it mandatory that the chief risk officer is appointed, the chief risk officer reports to the board directly and, and have a complete independence and have full access to the board uh, as opposed to the executive management. Second one, which is very, very important in the structure is to ensure that there is a delineation between risk management and risk taking. What is this? I mean, like, for example, again, if you use uh, banking, uh, in like, let's say credit risk. In credit risk, credit risk, basically, the chief risk officer's office is involved in putting in credit policies, putting in scorecards, putting in uh, analytics, looking at a portfolio uh, management, and so on and so forth. Whereas the actual credit approval happens with the chief credit officer, who is part of the management and he reports to the CEO. This is a requirement which has been mandated by Central Bank. And clearly that's what it means by, by delineating risk management versus risk taking. It, essentially the whole idea is that risk managers are not involved in actually taking the risk. And this is one of the reasons why also compliance and risk, risk have been segregated in, in the eyes of CBUAE. Of course, uh, there is also another question. It's a very, very, very difficult question, very tough question is on compensation of risk managers. Ideal compensation for risk managers should not be dependent on, on profits. Essentially, the risk manager, risk manager should not be remunerated based on how much profit the bank makes or the, the, the organization makes. So, but it's a very, very difficult thing to, to kind of implement. But having said that, uh, I think what is what actually is prescribed by even the Central Bank of UAE is that you need to have uh, the, the variable component uh, should be minimal and we have a more uh, fixed component as far as remunerating risk managers are concerned. One thing which is also very, very important in risk management, when you talk about structure, you cannot uh, talk about structure without talking about people. Absolutely important that we need to have the right people in risk management. There's no question about it because risk management like what I mentioned, could be could be the whipping boys of many things. You know, when when everything is going right and you want to put in controls, people will be asking so many questions about it. But when something goes wrong, everybody will point out to the risk manager and say, "What were you doing?" So essentially, you know, you need to have that kind of uh, ability, like uh, exactly like what uh, uh, Mr. Nagesh mentioned in terms of how we deal with the management. You need to be really, you need to get into the 
into the skin of the management. You really need to also have the respectability of the management so that they listen to you. How will they listen to you? Only if you have a professionalism towards it, you have a good uh, you know, set of people who, who understand the business, understand and manage risk. It is absolutely important uh, that this, this particular aspect, and, and I'm, again, I took some time in talking about it again and again, because that's very, very important. Now, defining risk, it is, again, this is another very key element in approaching risk management. And if you look at our chief guest, he did mention that that when he spoke to the, the board, their understanding of risk was different from the management understanding of risk. That's what happens. If you do not have one view of risk across the organization, this is what happens. And remember that every organization, be it a manufacturing or, uh, or trading or financial services for the matter, should actually articulate its risk appetite in all the activities and say that this is the understanding of risk that we are going to take. Because like what I said, you are going to take risk. No question saying that I will not take any risk. It'll, that will not happen. You have to take risk. You need to understand this is the level of risk we are, not, we are able to take for this type of an organization. Again, one size fits all approach doesn't work. Basically, uh, depending on the size of the organization, depending on what is the strategy of the business, you need to understand and agree that this is the risk appetite that the businesses will take. And this is this understanding should be across the organization. The, it, is, it is just doesn't matter that only the management committee understands the risk in a certain way. And even if it is aligned with the board, that's great that the management and board have got a good understanding of risk. But if the junior management is not uh, aligned to it, you could have somebody at a junior level acting in a very different way than what you want to act. So essentially, this is very, very important that uh, that risks are defined and we have uh, and do not adopt a one size uh, fit all approach. Again, escalations, like what I mentioned, one uh, monitoring. I mean, one thing is to set risk appetites. Another thing is to monitor it because you can you can have all the best uh, controls in place on paper. But how do you know that all these controls are working? You need to have the monitoring tools. And of course, uh, the tools will, will give an information. The information needs to be escalated to the, to the right level. That's what I, I put it on the, under this uh, bucket. Now, again, I wanted to say that there is no silver bullet in how do you manage risk. Essentially, we all talk about automation. And, and let me be very clear. I am not. Uh, I am not against uh, any vendors. But having said that, you would have heard from uh, many vendors and many vendor presentations. You just implement this, and this will take care of everything. I mean, well, if it was like that, we would not have all the problems that we are facing in many of the businesses. There is no silver bullet. It just doesn't mean that you you can have a tool that will record the risk. You can have a tool that will monitor the risk. You can have a tool that will escalate the risk. But there is there. It does not be all and end all. You know there is no uh, there is no uh, way that you just implement a system and say that I've implemented the system. I will not have any problem. That's not possible. So there is no silver bullet. And this understanding is very very important for you to convey to the powers that be, including to the board. Because you know I mean it is all well to say that uh, you know you you. You know, you, you say that, uh, you know, we, we are well controlled, we are well managed, but I think the board should know that, that there is a possibility that something can go wrong. With the best of the intentions, whatever you want to do, there is a possibility that something will go, go wrong. A classic example is the pandemic preparedness and, and COVID-19. Well, if you look at the, the typical uh, DR plans and business continuity plans everybody had, we must have had the best of the business continuity plans. We said, okay, you know, what do we do? We need to have an alternate site. The alternate site should be ready. You get, be it a hot site or a cold site, doesn't matter. It should be ready. And as soon as one site goes down, the other one will come up. And basically we said, it should be in a different seismic zone. It should be different, uh, different electric grid because if the electricity fails, people can go there and work. All preparations done. In fact, uh, some of the multinationals went to the extent of also saying that they had, uh, they had backups in multiple countries. So basically, if, if one country goes down, they can actually move to another country. All preparedness, it was all ready. 
but unfortunately covid 19 struck globally so basically what happened all your bcp plans which like what i said was very well planned but unfortunately this was a global pandemic it struck down everywhere so so this is what i'm saying that not all risk can be prevented it cannot be prevented so you need to you need to have you know the document at that point of time to see what is best to do and and move on of course many of the organizations have survived they moved to work from home uh, you know all of this uh, new techniques that we have all learned in fact in ICA is one of the very first to learn these techniques because I remember, um, I, I think ICA Dubai particularly has probably thrived uh, during this time because we had more uh, sessions and more webinars than what we used to have when we had physical meetings. So, yeah, I mean, so this is how, you know, we've basically uh, gotten over this, uh, this particular problem. But basically what it is, is um, it's not if, but when. That's what should be in the mind of any risk professional. Uh, one other thing, the last but not least, in terms of uh, how do we manage risk, how do we talk to the boards, is one is to avoid scare tactics. It's always easy and, um, and, and, and it's quite natural for people to go and scare their board saying that, oh, you know, what will happen? Everything will come down. You know, let's all, you know, if you need more uh, budgets, people use, uh, tend to use scare tactics and say that this whole, Business will come down. Let's go and invest in this and et cetera, et cetera. And sometimes it may be worthwhile. Sometimes it could be that you did an over investment or something. Uh, a typical scare tactic, uh, I'm sure many of us were still working at the time, or maybe the youngsters may not be, is, uh, is uh, year 2000 problem. I remember year 2000 was such a scare tactic. And uh, if, if people are old enough, if you are working at that time, you'll have known that we had news saying that the world will come to halt, the lifts will not work, fly, planes will fall down from the sky, trains will stop working, uh, and you know there's going to be chaos, all traffic lights are going to stop, and there's going to be massive uh, accidents on the road, so on and so forth. That was Y2K. Of course, some of the IT companies thrived at that time because of Y2K. That kind of scare tactics is, should be avoided. Basically, so what do we do? How do we educate the board? How do we educate the ma management, uh, the, the rest of the management in terms of, uh, in terms of risk awareness is to quantify as much as possible you quantify. There are questions raised whether, you know, like for example, can a cyber risk be quantified, for example? I mean, there are tools. There are tools where you can actually quantify cyber risk. There are agencies, and I do not want to mention any of those because they are all commercial ones and I don't want to be promoting any of the commercial agencies, basically who do a, uh, who do a risk score and give you a, a rating on your, on your uh, cyber hygiene. That is quantification. You can still do that. And of course, what you could also do is to have external validation and you've got experts in the field, let's get them. I mean, it's not as if we cannot do that as, in, as internally, uh, we can do a validation, but what will be lacking is a benchmarking exercise. A good, uh, a, a good uh, exercise will be to benchmark the best practices in your organization with those uh, with others. So that'll be another tool. So these are some of the some of the tricks that uh, you know some of the tools that people can use in terms of managing risk. Now. Again, moving on, I know this is a, for want of time, basically, there are also new, uh, new soft skills which the chief risk officers must, must adopt, apart from doing all these approaches. One is equipped with the understanding of the new risk, understanding of the new technologies that are available, like what uh, Mr. Nagesh Pingay mentioned, and, and, uh, and also I think the chief guest also mentioned, there are all these new trends like robotic process automation, machine learning, artificial intelligence. The question is, I mean, it's all nice to say this, and, and of course, these are all the words which uh, you will find in every single presentation, I guess, uh, all over the world these days. But how will it help risk management? And why will it help risk management? And why do we need to do this? Simply because, like what I said, the breadth of risk management has expanded. And, there is, and nobody is going to give you unlimited resources in terms of people to manage. So clearly, there is a need to, to be able to do more with less. And how do we do that? Basically, if you want to do, if you want to do uh, uh, justice to the new areas of risk management, 
then clearly something has to give in. It is, it's, it's, it is not a, it is not that you have unlimited resources and you keep on hiring and getting people to do whatever it is. And that's not possible. I mean, let's be practical here. So what to do is to actually automate some of the tasks that can be done, like for example, monitoring tools. When you do monitoring tools, you can use machine learning to avoid a lot of false positives. Uh, that's a possibility that we can do, and that will naturally reduce the work of, uh, of analysts, be it a fraud analyst or a, or a uh, SOC analyst or whatever it is, or a cyber analyst. And similarly, another uh, very important soft skill that CRO need to have, uh, I think this is uh, true for not just CROs, I think anybody is an ability to listen, which is what uh, was also mentioned in great detail by uh, the previous speaker, because because uh, you, you, you need to listen. I mean, only by listening, you're going to learn new tricks. There are new things happening in the market. You know, if you think that you know all and you, know, and, and you like to hear your own voice, I'm sorry, that's not going to help. Listening to others is very, very important soft skill. And, and more importantly, I think the two important thing for risk managers, one is integrity, which I think is true for everybody, more so for a risk manager and more importantly, Professional skepticism. And I'm saying professional skepticism, it means that you're not, not being, um, um, uh, what do you call, it? looking at everything with suspicion, but everything, looking at everything with a professional skepticism, not looking at the person who brought it and say, oh, no, 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 if this guy brought this, that must be a problem. Let me go ahead and look at it. I think that's not the right way. It is to look at what exactly we need to do uh, by, by having a professional analysis of what is the problem. Um, and again, which I said, adopting new risk tools, which is very important, data analytics, big data. Today, it's very, very important, simply because one, uh, one thing which uh, the pandemic brought about is basically converting a lot of whatever used to be happening manually into digitally. So what that helps is that we today, we have a much larger digital footprint that we ever had. In, in terms of uh, not just small, not just large organizations, even the smaller ones. So what it means is that the more data that you have, the more analytics that you can do. So clearly that's an opportunity today that you adopt the risk tools because you have the data, you have uh, you know everything in a digital format. It helps uh, to be able to do that. And lastly, like what I said, is a balanced view of risk, which is very, very important rather than having a Scare tactics or, or completely being um, on, on the other side, completely being risk averse or being completely uh, being uh, not risk aware. Again, the same analogy of brake also works the other way. You know, when you're going in a high speed, you suddenly slam the brakes, the car is going to tumble. So that, that's again, it's very, very important how you, how you uh, basically use the brake. It's very, very important for a, for a risk manager to understand that. And that's where we say that uh, it's very, very important to, to learn these new tricks, have a balanced view of risk. Uh, it's quite important. Uh, I've just uh, stated here, I'm not going to you know, talk about in great detail. I'm not sure if it is visible to all given the small fonts, but basically, basically what we are saying is that to manage this new age risk, we need new capability, no question about it like for example, fraud analytics, threat intelligence. It's very, very important because, uh, you know, you, if, and, and, and what it has brought in is, uh, there's a very interesting observation on threat intelligence. What is interesting about uh, having threat intelligence is that globalization has actually helped in, of course, many, body, many people in many ways. It has also brought in the risk. So what happens is, if it has happened elsewhere, and uh, in, in a in a cyber crime, and 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 uh, and we are sitting in UAE, we can learn from that experience. We can learn from what happened, you know, in in a in a let's say in a Western world, and this is what happened when they automated it or whatever it is, and 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 basically use that intelligence to be able to stop uh, frauds or cyber cyber crimes here. Like what I mentioned when I say stop, it means reduce. There's no way that uh, you know we could completely stop it, but of course we can. We can always uh, we can always uh, try and prevent all of these. 
uh, one other thing which uh, i think is more important for uh, for uh, banks i guess is device tagging i'm sure uh, all of you would have read so much in the newspapers uh, in in uae about uh, sim frauds and you would have had multiple multiple messages from multiple banks in terms of uh, in terms of how uh, sim swapping had, had happened and and how uh, people could easily uh, you know somebody get a duplicate sim and be able to compromise your accounts etc etc device tagging is a very very key tool which will actually uh, reduce this uh, the sim swap business anyway there are there are lot of other tools like what i said automation threat hunting uh, of course uh, for a for a digital heavy organizations nothing better than having your own uh, 24 by 7 security operations if your organization is not uh, equipped or not of the right size to have your own 24 by 7 operations you could always uh, you know there are there are i think a lot of uh, organizations that uh, do it on an outsource basis people can consider that and again when you talk of outsource that's another one you know when you when you today outsourcing has become a reality and outsourcing is is everywhere so third party risk is we managed extremely well and one last thing in all of this risk management i think we need to understand uh, which i think uh, to some extent was also touched upon by the previous speaker is internal threats internal threats are a lot more uh, serious today simply because uh, you have got people working at home you are not in a controlled environment you may go to a call center where you say you cannot have your own phone you cannot have this you cannot have this you cannot uh, you know look at other people's information uh, all of that stuff is all possible but today people are working at home and that's what uh, i think uh, Uh, mr nagesh pingi also mentioned that it's not enough that we know who the your employee is we probably need to know who their family is but you know to that extent i mean all i'm saying is that uh, insider threat is is absolutely uh, something which is which cannot be avoided at any point of time and there is no uh, one tool that we can use to stop insider threat i mean you need a variety of tools including right from of course recruiting the right kind of people how do you have monitoring do you have a network monitoring do you have a peripheral security and and what happens within the your network do you do you monitor what's happening in your network do you know uh, you know how do you how do you use uh, for example one of the tools here mentioned is anomaly detection anomaly detection is all well to say but the point is you know you need to know what is an anomaly to be able to know what is an anomaly you need to know what is a normal so only when you know what is normal then you know what is abnormal behavior so it's not a is not a very simple uh, task that you can do all in all i think uh, all i wanted to say is that the life of a cro is very very difficult <laughs> because uh, you know there is there is multiple things happening at the same time i leave with the one of the last slides where it says again i'm just reminding everyone that it's not if by but when uh, there are means what you can do about cyber risk for example is you can actually plan for breach preparedness there are cyber risk insurance also available these days uh, you can do pandemic preparedness like what i said certain to certain extent we can prepare because like what i said the bcms of the previous era has not helped your pandemic preparedness when it, we had a global pandemic but primarily what we need to do is to practice simulate i think more than all of this educate i think it's very very important that you educate your employees on risk management you educate your employees on on what uh, what is the risk taking risk appetite of the organization and at the same time you need you, you know in a, if you are in a service industry like for example if you are in banking you need to educate your customers as well because you know you, it may well be that you have got all the precautions but then you know you are weakest as your last link so basically when you talk of third party risk you need to educate your vendors you need to educate your customers you need to educate your stakeholders and that is uh, again very very important task and risk management uh that's all i have and uh, once again i wish to thank uh, the um, the the management of ica dubai for giving me the opportunity and happy to take any questions thank you so much thank you thank you very much uh, ca ramakrishnan ji thank you very much for addressing our members on risk management can you remove your uh, powerpoint presentation sure yeah
Thank you, sir. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I think uh, you have given a great comparison between the traditional risk and uh, emerging risk. Traditional risk you compared with the cancer. So you know that, uh, I mean, uh, you know it's going to die definitely, but gradually. And emerging risk is like you compared with the cardiac arrest, which can happen at any given point of time and you are finished. So we have to be careful with emerging risk as well. And uh, thank you very much, sir. And uh, now I request our XCOM member, CA Jayaprakas Agarwal, to manage the QA session. Over to you, Jayaprakas. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Ramakrishnan, sir, good presentation. I loved uh, the you. fact you were straight on the fact saying this is this is the fact, this is the hard fact. Please eat it uh, uh, and understand it. So that that is something which I loved about it. With this, what I will do is we'll go straight away to the first question. Uh, sir, sir, you were raising your hand for quite some time. It must be paining now. So it's your chance now to please go ahead and ask a question. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, it's a wonderful presentation, uh, Mr. Ram. Uh, I've been thoroughly enjoying it. Um, and uh, it's not only uh, financial risk. I, also, I think you also fairly covered uh, uh, some aspects uh, which we studied in CISA uh, and uh, about the uh, anomaly identification exceptional reports so a wonderful thing. So I think uh, only one thing I, I would like to know, like I think uh, uh, CRO is one of the uh, riskiest to roll uh, uh, because <laughs> if something happens, if something happens, uh, then, you know, uh, you know, uh, fire this guy, you know, because why he was not highlighted. So it's like uh, when you highlight something, also risky because you need to justify that on what basis you are highlighting this particular risk. And if you don't highlight also, you are in trouble tomorrow if something happens. So that is something, uh, the area which I don't want to take it in my life. Uh, anyway, now there are a lot of risk uh, in terms of financial uh, risk because which will end up in uh, uh, provisioning requirements because you need to go uh, to CFO. Uh, you know, these are all the risks we have. I need to take provision, the CFO is not going to like it. Uh, so now, uh, how do you justify, I mean, what kind of models? I know that we heard about a lot of things like Blast, uh, Black Souls, uh, Monte Carlo. You do a lot of uh, analysis in, in, in terms of uh, collecting the data based on empirical evidence or, and you also input a lot of variables. Uh, you know, for example, if, if you have a customer uh, who has a huge exposure in uh, uh, real estate and you need to take all the data, uh, how the real estate market is going in Dubai, and whether this particular uh, project is going to kick off, whether the customer will pay back and all these things. So a lot of variables involved in this, all this modeling and things like that. So what, mm -hmm. what sort of, uh, you know, like uh, even you need to, you know, loss of default, there are so many things uh, uh, in terms of banks, you know, uh, compared to uh, normal corporate. So how do you handle this? And if you can give us a overall, you know, like uh, how do you uh, uh, identify the financial risk and provisioning requirement and what sort of model you use. If you can give us a brief, uh, it'll be helpful to us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, it's a long question. Yes, uh, I, I uh, thank you for the sympathy shown on the chief risk officer. It is a difficult role. It's no question it's a difficult role. This is what I'm saying, you know, in terms of first things first, how do we deal with uh, co conflicts? Was we have, if I can sum it up in one, one state in your question, saying that if there is a risk, how do I highlight the risk? If I highlight the risk, what happens? Am I going to be thrown out of the organization, et cetera? I think this is where it's very, very important that we get it right with the board and with the, with the management. The tone at the top is very, very important. And the, the management and the board needs to have the right understanding of risk the same way as you see it. You're absolutely right. Because uh, I, I do remember that once uh, uh, very soon when I when I taken over this role, I had put up a presentation to the to my board on a on couple of incidents that had happened elsewhere in terms of data breaches in, in, in a few banks outside. So when I, when, I, when, I, when I went to put up this thing, when I spoke to my uh, colleagues elsewhere, they said, Ram, you must be mad to go and tell this to the board. Are you sure you want to do this? I said, yes. So I went to the board. I put up this presentation. The question was asked to me, Ram, this is all great. You said all these things. Can you... Can you guarantee that this will not happen in this bank? This was a straight question. And I had to give a straight answer, of course. This is the board. The straight answer I gave is that I cannot guarantee. Nobody in this world can guarantee that. All I can ensure is that we will not be a low-hanging fruit. That's why I said risk is inevitable. And interestingly, 
I mean, I'm, I'm very thankful that a very enlightened board, the board member said, if you had told me that this will never happen to this bank, I would have fired you immediately. Because, because he said, this is what happens. I mean, the, so the, the, the trick in managing conflicts is, yes, you need to highlight. There's no question of not highlighting, but it's very, very important that you create a climate. And of course, the management at the board needs to create a climate that you are able to articulate. And that's where independence comes in. That's where structures come in. And that's where your, your collaboration and understanding of risk across the organization comes in. That, that'll answer that question, I guess. The second one on, on, on uh, models, particularly on provisions. Yes, it's very interesting because uh, uh, this, this is a, I think we need a full full blown topic on this and I am sure ICA themselves had several sessions on, on IFRS 9 and, and all the models. Uh, there is always a question which comes that, you know, if, if the models were so great, how come all the, uh, you know, rating authorities uh, downgrade it after an event? So basically, this is an issue. I mean, models look at, we do have models. I mean, all everybody has credit trust models, but I think, I think what is important is anticipation. You, you know, you need to have a business knowledge to understand a model. If you're going to simply say that I will follow this model, the model tells me that this is what is the ECL, this is what the probability of default, this is what happens. This is the LGD, this is the EG, you, you, uh, LGD, PD, you multiply that, you'll get a expected credit loss. It, it doesn't work that way. You need to understand in the, the models, you need to understand the business side of the models, how it works. And that's why if you look at most organizations, they also have got management overlays. So essentially you look at, you understand your business, you know a business, based on your business, you also take management overlays, both on the, I mean, more likely on the, on the conservative side or otherwise, because just purely relying on models is not good. Having said that, you cannot say that I will do everything judgmentally and you know, I will not rely on any model. That also doesn't work. You need to have the models, but you need to understand your business. You need to have your judgment overlay. I mean, talking about like, for example, you are mentioning about a property market. Yes, it is very important. So how do you do that? How do you do, how do we do, you know, various things so that's why I said again, that we need to have the right structure and the right amount of people. The right amount of people, not, not in terms of quantity, but quality. That's absolutely important. Like for example, if you look at uh, my role, I handle credit risk, market risk, operational risk, uh, treasury middle office, internal control, information security, fraud management. I mean, do you think one man can successfully do all these things? No, we need to have, and the trick in, in actually getting the right people in risk management is not just people who have got the, got the ability, have got the knowledge, but also got the passion. If they do not have the passion in risk management, they should not be in risk management because it is a difficult job. In some ways, uh, you know, I don't like to use the word, but in some ways it's a thankless job because, uh, you know, like what you mentioned, when things go wrong, people will remember you. When things go right, they don't remember you. So which is why to be in risk management, not only you need to get the right guys, you need to get the right guys with the right passion. Uh, hopefully I've answered your question. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Thanks. sir. We have another question uh, with Mr. Pratap. I can see multiple questions uh, people want, want, members want to ask, but in the interest of time, this is the last question which we will take. After that, uh, if time permits, at the end, we will take all those questions. So, Pratap, please go ahead with your question. Thanks, Jay. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Mr. Ram, for the wonderful presentation. It's been enlightening us uh, on various aspects of the risk uh, model uh, we face this time, especially on the pandemic preparedness, which we touched upon. I think something related to that, I think with the with the COVID and obviously uh, with the central bank coming up with a slew of measures, including the test scheme, which has also been extended multiple times and until December 2021 as well. I mean, how do you see yourself uh, from risk uh, uh, management point of view, give you your views on how uh, how the industry is going to rebound uh, starting 2022 or what sort of risk measures do you think that is helping the economy at the moment? I just thought I'll take your views on that. Let me, let me again qualify. This is my opinion not opinion of right bank, sure. but essentially uh, it, it's from my experience. I think uh, I was extremely pleased when central bank moved in very swiftly because when the pandemic hit, there were two large concerns for the entire banking fraternity. Uh, the two, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about all this new risk, but anyway, the new risk came later when people started working from home 
and uh, all the cyber risk. But the, the two things which immediately kind of hit us is what's going to happen on liquidity, what is going to happen on credit risk. Uh, and interestingly, the first concern was liquidity. Banks fail because of not having liquidity. Otherwise, I think liquidity is another one where you know it could be a sudden kind of drop and you're finished. I think that's where I think we, have, we were quite blessed that the, the central bank came out very swiftly on, on actually putting up the, the liquidity support they gave to all the banks. And that actually helped a lot uh, at that time. Of course, uh, they've also continued to extend this, which has been very helpful. Now, the second part uh, on credit risk is, is again, you know, through the liquidity support, we were able to support, like if you look at our portfolio, we've been largely a small business and, uh, and retail bank. So we were able to support the small businesses. So how do we see it going forward? is it's very interesting because what has happened over the last one year, I think we need to look at uh, COVID pandemic as it happened in three phases, you know, pre-pandemic, lockdown, and post-lockdown. Because that are the three phases how you need to see and how we see the risk. Uh, the, the most worrisome phase for us was when lockdown was announced, lockdown was in progress, what is going to happen, how long it's going to remain. Nobody had a clue at that point of time. So we were a bit worried, but having said that, like what I said, the, the support which, uh, which we got from Central Bank and others, we were able to, we were able to extend the support to the, the small businesses. A lot of small businesses even today are extremely happy with the kind of support that was provided. Now, post lockdown, we see a lot of people are actually, uh, actually come up. They have, I mean, of course, there are very few uh, industries which did well during, even during lockdown. Particularly, we see cafes who are doing uh, takeaways. They were doing a roaring business. And even if you look at it today, I mean, you see, you see the talabats of the world. I mean, zipping past right, left, and left center. And of course, pharmaceuticals did well, etc. But post lockdown, also many of those have survived. So what has happened essentially is that uh, I we are quite positive about about what has happened now in terms of the recovery because we do believe that people who have stayed back, people who have who have actually uh, had these businesses, reopened the businesses, because they want to fight it out. Why is it they want to fight it out? There are a few, again, reasons. One is the, the central, the, not only central bank, the government is making the right amount of uh, noises, now, right amount of, uh, of uh, presentations, right amount of announcements on support to SMEs. And I think that has gone on. So people have said, let's fight it out here. That's one. And secondly, you will look at it, uh, some of the uh, some of the uh, all, all the fears were taken out in terms of fears of you know there's a new law coming on check bonds and so on and so forth uh, and thirdly and this is my analogy this is not my banks so let me be very clear my analogy is where this is where I think the pandemic was a difference because everybody what used to happen is where businesses failed, people used to go back and say that I will start this business in India and I'll survive. They knew that if you go back to India, there's no way that you're going to survive, India or wherever it is they are from. So essentially, this is a global problem. They said, wherever I go, there is a problem. Let me try and fight it out here. And there are people who have actually done that. And with, I think, uh, support uh, and, and also looking at the new normal, which is, which is now the way of living, that's what has happened, essentially. That's why if you look around, you see a lot more people now uh, confident. And, and I think a big booster is also the vaccines. Of course, uh, people may say whatever it is about the vaccine, but you look at the vaccine drive here, it's been very highly successful. And I know that ICA themselves have been, uh, have been fantastic in, this, in this, uh, this front by organizing so many of, the, of those uh, vaccination drives. Right. All of this together, uh, is it completely great that everything is out of it, it's not. But having said that, is it going down south? It is not. I think we are at a stabilizing level. And one of the, of course, uh, big events which are looking at is also Expo 2020, which is 2021 now. Uh, that is also expected to bring in more people. And I, I think that's all, it is all, it all comes up together in the sense, you know, these are all the uh, actions which is going on in the market and what's happening outside world. Given all of that, if you ask me, am, am, I, am I skewed towards positivity or towards negativity? I'm skewed towards positivity. It's a very simple answer.
Thank you, sir. Thank you. I love positivity is the way forward. I can see the clap there. Now, moving on. Sir, you heard about gun and bullet? Wow. Gun and bullet. Well, people tell me that uh, I used to shoot with a gun, you know, when I've talked to my guys in my office. But yeah, otherwise, And yeah. you're, I mean, I will say you, you were straight like bullet. You were fast and you were on target. That was how I will define your presentation and answers. That was fire and I loved it. Over to you, Mr. Secretary. Thank Are you. you thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, CA. K.S. Ramakrishnan for an excellent presentation and also thank our ex-com member C.A. Jai Prakash Agarwal for managing the Q&A. Uh, now I request our chairman C.A. Sundar Nurani to present the certificate of appreciation to C.A. K.S. Ramakrishnan. Let me share the certificate of appreciation, sir. Just a minute. Oh, sorry. I think I... <laughs> Selected the wrong one. Just a minute. Let me open it, sir. Sorry for yeah. that. In the, in the meantime, let me thank uh, Mr. Ramakrishnan for the wonderful presentation and uh, for taking time to address the members. I hope uh, that after hearing uh, uh, C.A. Ramakrishnan ji, more and more young members uh, will uh, probably take the role of uh, the chief risk officer role because this is something which uh, will which is required for all the organizations and uh, as uh, ram mentioned correctly if something goes wrong the first person to be blamed will be the chief risk officer if everything goes right then you know there is no uh, uh, i mean uh, there, there is no incentivation uh, this is what uh, I could understand from Ram. Uh, I believe it is not a thankless job, but I think uh, uh, these are the people uh, who uphold uh, uh, the profession and who, who have high integrity and uh, who are always, uh, you know, skeptical about uh, what is happening. So thank you, uh, uh, C.A. Ramakrishnan, sir. Uh, wish you all the very best. And I hope thank that, you. Uh, you know, more youngsters will come and take up the profession uh, from the Chartered Accountancy also. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, C.A. Ramakrishnanji. Thank you very much for an excellent presentation. Uh, now I think our next speaker, C.A., oh, sorry, Mr. Harendra Kaila, who is going to address us on corporate governance. And uh, for his introduction, I will request our ex-com member, C.A. Amit Ketan. Amit Ketan, over to you. Uh, thank you, Secretary, sir. So let me introduce our uh, next speaker, Mr. Harendra Kailath. Harendra Kailath is a senior director at Price Waterhouse Coopers based in Dubai. And he is the Middle East Risk Assurance Lead for the governance and compliance services and has worked extensively with large private businesses, corporates, and government-owned entities. He is also an expert family governance advisor and has worked with a number of family business across the Middle East in the areas of governance and succession planning. In a career spanning over 25 years spread across the UK, India and the Middle East, Harendra has spent the majority of his career with the big four where he has led the several large-scale business trans transformation programs covering strategy development, governance, risk compliance, operating model design, including organization design, KPI development, policies, and procedures. Harendra holds an MBA with distinction from the London City University Business School and trained as a chartered accountant from ICAI in England and Wales. So please welcome Mr. Harendra Kelath. Over to you, sir. Thank you uh, for that introduction. And uh, let me first uh, start by thanking uh, Sundar and members of the management committee for uh, giving me this opportunity to, to speak to you uh, at this very prestigious event and also for the rather difficult task of following my very uh, learned and experienced uh, speakers before me. Um, so, so thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ramkrishnan and, uh, and Mr. Nagesh for your insights because you have uh, very well set out the uh, uh, the parameters around which my own presentation will, will take shape. Um, thank you also, Amit, for the for the nice introduction. Um, 
I, I look forward to being able to offer some insights into, into how I see corporate governance uh, you know, in this region. I have, um, you know, over the last 20 years in the, in the Middle East region, seen uh, it evolve, uh, you know, from, 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 from very traditional roots to something that is a bit more advanced at the moment, but there's still a long way to go. Um, and in that respect, I offer a, a personal perspective. Um, uh, so a personal perspective really on how I think governance can be enhanced in the future. Uh, but also the role that people such as yourself as members of the finance community you know, ha can play a very important role in bringing about the sort of change in thinking, uh, the change in traditional thinking that we often see, uh, you know, so, that, so that there's fresh insight and there's fresh impetus to, uh, to, you know, to raise the game as far as governance is concerned in our part of the world. So, so thank you very much. Um, as far as my presentation is concerned, um, I will cover a few key themes. First is about just governance, uh, the emerging themes and definitions around governance, why it's important, which clearly all of you will know well. Um, I also want to talk about a few emerging themes. Uh, and these themes dovetail with global trends, but also what's going on here in the Middle East, because this is where most of us are at the moment. And hopefully this will throw some ideas around how uh, people such as yourselves in the profession uh, you know, can start looking at risk, can start looking at your role as internal auditors to, uh, you know, to ensure that governance uh, you know, continues to be this focal point of how good businesses are run. I'll also talk about uh, you know, a few high profile governance failures. Uh, these are interesting case studies because they provide us with, with certain insights about what can go wrong. And as I do that, I must, I must add that this is all based on publicly available information. So hopefully I won't be uh, sued by anybody anytime soon for, for any comment I might make on, on one of any of those cases. Um, also, I will uh, give you a feel for what I think are, uh, are potential telltale signs of weak governance in an organization. Uh, these are things that uh, people uh, in our profession need to keep an eye over. And these are red flags, in a manner of speaking, that, uh, that we need to, uh, to be aware of. I'll share some thoughts with you on how we should respond, having identified those telltale weak, uh, weaknesses, and, and then conclude with uh, a little bit of an overview of my own personal perspective about governance in this region. Okay. So, so what is governance, right? And, and clearly, I've, I've realized that this is one of the most overused uh, terminologies in, in you know in in the business in, in business language um, you ask x you ask y everybody has an interpretation or an explanation of what governance is but when you distill it down i've i've come to about three or four different views that i often hear about what people think is governance uh, for for one people think it's primarily only about the board so what i call is board governance and for them, corporate governance is about the board, its size, its structure, its composition, its operations, and so on. And, and that truly is you know, the, the centerpiece of what governance is all about. But there are other definitions as well. Uh, legal structures, for example, right? And, and many of you, corporate governance is around how you manage your entities, uh, you know, the organizational model around how your legal structures are set up. And we call that entity governance. Others look at corporate governance in terms of a system of processes and controls uh, within the organization, what I call operational governance. And for others, it's a much wider concept. It encompasses everything that we do. It's everything that you do in the way that your business is managed, right? Um, nothing wrong with these definitions, but, but the question to really ask yourselves is, how does this translate into a definition for governance for my particular organization, right? You've got to ask yourself, what does governance mean to you? Particularly in the context of the, the world we currently live in where uh, there is so much change, the risks that we are looking at, the risks that we face on a daily basis are, are evolving, many of which we cannot predict. Uh, and really governance needs to take care and reflect these sorts of things. Okay. So, a point of view on governance, my personal view is that, uh, you know, about governance is, is very much uh, 
close to the third point of view I mentioned in my earlier slide. Um, this is where uh, you know, we, we see governance hinging on, on five key pillars at the heart of which lies risk, right? Ultimately, you know, a good governance model must address the risks that an organization faces, okay? Um, and, and I'll come to that in a second, but what about the other uh, four, uh, four pillars that this, uh, this slide talks about? The first is leadership strategy and culture. Now, previous speakers have talked about tone at the top, and this is exactly what that means. We're talking about here, uh, leadership that's exercised or that is exhibited by the board, by the executive management in the way they conduct themselves, the way they communicate, the way they demonstrate values to the business. This is absolutely the starting point of what good governance should look like because everything follows from the example that senior management and the leadership actually demonstrate. It's the tone at the top. But then the next step and the second more important pillar is also structure and oversight. It's around how do you take that tone from the top and embed that into your structures, your processes and your systems, right? How do you convert that into, uh, from, from just talk into action, yeah? And for that, we're talking about the board, board committees, the role of the different assurance functions such as internal audit, risk, compliance, et cetera. What is the role that they need to play in order to drive that tone from the top? And so there's a new terminology that I often hear about, which is called tone at the middle, right? And it's absolutely important that just as it is important for tone at the top for the board and executive management, it's important that middle management also demonstrates the same behaviors, the same attitudes and the same ethics that is expected from, you know, from, from the senior leadership. Risk, as I mentioned, is very much the heart of what good governance is all about. Um, organizations need to understand risk. They need to look at risks from all its different dimensions. We talk about strategic risk, financial risk, operational risks, environmental risks, what we call hazard risks, and, and every other kind of risk that you can, you can, uh, you can think about. Uh, the previous speaker spoke about emerging risks and traditional risks. All these need to be factored in when we talk about corporate governance. The fourth pillar is management information and controls. Ultimately, once you've set up the systems and you've set up the structures, you need to have the information and the management systems in place in order to feed back information. You need timely and accurate information. You need data-driven information. You need good KPIs in place uh, in order to measure your performance and ensure that you're rewarding the right behaviors. And, and the last is, is trust and transparency. When organizations succeed in creating uh, you know, the right systems, the right processes, the tone from the top, trust and transparency is something that automatically evolves. All right. So, so these are the five pillars on, on, on which a good governance model needs to rest. And underpinning all that is the management of change. This is clearly important because none of these activities can take place in a silo. They're all interrelated to one another. They all need to be taken holistically and they all need to be embedded into the way business is run and managed, right? And this is not a one-time exercise. Uh, reinforcing the messages about good governance, how it should be done, what the risks are, et cetera, need to be a continuous process. This is not something that is a one-time exercise. So why is corporate governance important? I mean, this is again a, a quotation I took from, from, from a recent report I read. It is that it lies at the heart of everything that goes right or wrong with the business. And, and the OECD actually summarized it quite nicely when they said that, look, good corporate governance is about building an environment of trust, transparency, and accountability. These are key words that resonate in this modern day economy, uh, particularly trust and transparency. Organizations that are able to demonstrate trust or are able to demonstrate accountability in the way they do generate trust. And that trust automatically leads to improved financial performance, better risk management, and therefore meeting the expectations of your shareholders. Now in the Middle East, uh, quite interesting to, to have observed what are some of the key drivers that we see 
uh, that are sort of uh, driving the whole governance agenda in our part of the world. And I've looked at it in, in, two, in two parts. One are internal drivers and external drivers. But internally, what are these drivers? So the first is the pressure on boards, right? It's absolutely no secret that boards of companies in our part of the world are under pressure, right? And this is not just in the UAE, but everywhere around the GCC. Uh, they are expected to, to uh, you know, to exercise oversight over the business. And for that, they need to understand what's going on around them in terms of key risks. The evolving risk landscape is another very key internal driver, right? Uh, there are traditional risks, there are emerging risks, there are risks like COVID, which are, are, are the sort of risks that you cannot plan for because these are, uh, you know, uh, th these are risks that typical ERM approaches through risk registers, et cetera, do not uh, take into account. So, so keeping an eye on, on that factor is, is clearly quite important. If you're a large family business, for example, and, and as you know, the Middle East has, uh, you know, is, is, is full of family businesses. Continuity and succession planning is another very, very important driver for what's driving uh, organizations to look at risk. Of course, ensuring financial performance, protecting the reputation of your organization. These are all key factors that the boards of directors in, 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 in these companies are, are looking out for. But also external drivers. Now, what are some of these external trends that we're seeing? Well, there are a series of global trends that we're seeing, and I'll talk about that in the next slide. There's clearly regulation, uh, not just in the UAE, but in the wider GCC and globally as well. Key factors that is driving the entire governance agenda. Access to capital, another pretty important uh, driver, uh, you know, with, with recent slump in oil prices, uh, organizations in our part of the world are looking more and more for external sources of funding and, and capital and being able to demonstrate good governance is something that is, is clearly you know, front and center of, uh, you know, of how governance is looked at. Corporate failures is another very, very obvious uh, driver for, for why governance continues to be important. Um, and, and again, I'll, I'll talk about this uh, in, in a minute. Uh, this sort of spate of corporate collapses seems to be an enduring feature and, and, uh, and clearly not every organization wants to fall into that trap. Debt governance, mergers and acquisitions, etc. These are all critical drivers for why corporate governance continues to be important. So what's going on around the Middle East and particularly, uh, you know, globally? And the interesting thing is that it's really, it comes down to a mix of both uh, traditional and new themes, okay? Uh, and, and, and this is really just my perspective of, of what I see as, as emerging trends. So the first is the composition of the board of directors, right? Um, something that is a very traditional theme, something that everybody talks about when they talk about corporate governance, but its importance cannot be underemphasized or overemphasized rather, okay? Um, having the right skills, having the right qualifications, having the right people, uh, and not just having an ornamental board, as, uh, as uh, Mr. Nagesh had mentioned, is absolutely critical. Yeah. Um, integrated GRC. Now, some of you have, have known and, and do know the concept of uh, governance risk and compliance. Um, individually, these have been uh, you know, fairly prominent in our region, but more and more what I'm beginning to see is that organizations are now looking at integrated GRC. No longer are they, uh, are we receiving, you know, requests for proposals and, and so on for, for just, uh, you know, an inspection of your governance or your risk function or your compliance function. What they're asking for is how can we look at GR and C together, right? What are the typical operating models? How do we ensure that we don't operate in silos, but that these key critical functions are operating in an integrated fashion, holistically, and actually meeting the requirements of the board and their shareholders. The other theme that I'm hearing more and more of, and which I've been actively involved in in recent times, is the governance of subsidiaries. Again, a previous speaker brought this up. Um, governance of subsidiaries is actually a key trend and a key area that most organizations need to be looking at if they aren't already doing that. 
Why is that so? It's because in addition to your own parent organization, your subsidiaries can be material subsidiaries. These are where risks emerge. And these are where the parent company typically does not actually have great insight into because these are being managed separately under a separate risk function or separate internal audit function. So, so governance of subsidiaries is something that we're seeing more and more of. Um, and setting up integrated frameworks in a way that a parent company has sufficient oversight over the way, they, over the way their subsidiaries are operating, but yet not uh, becoming operationally involved. The fourth um, trend that uh, you know, is, is very much also a global theme is around this idea of diversity. And we're not talking diversity just in terms of, of gender diversity. We're also talking in terms of nationality. But from a de gender diversity point of view, uh, the UAE has been pretty proactive about this. Uh, you know, the Securities and Commodities Authority has made it mandatory now for a female member to be on the board of every listed companies. Uh, more and more you hear in the press about diversity. The fact is that this is not just uh, uh, window dressing. Diversity is, is important. Uh, and there are plenty of studies which actually suggest that a board that has more female members than they currently are is actually a better board because they bring different insights, more thought and, and different points of view into how uh, you know, board performance uh, takes place. The fifth point is around internal controls. Now, again, this is something that that's not new. All the previous speakers have talked about, but it's becoming and it continues to be a really important theme uh, you know, in, in our part of the world. Uh, many of you are familiar with the concept of uh, ICFR or internal controls over financial reporting. Uh, lots of legislation has come out over this you know, in recent years, 2016, 2017. Um, the Abu Dhabi Accountability Authority has been an author of one of them, uh, the SCA and also the Qatar Financial Markets Authority. So, so clearly traction on that uh, and it continues to be uh, a fairly important theme. And the last one again, which dovetails into what we see going on globally is ESG, environment, social, and governance. Um, ESG is, uh, you know, is, is again, picking up traction in the Middle East. Certainly for certain listed entities, there is now an obligation on them to report uh, ESG. Uh, environment, when we talk about environment, we're talking about, you know, um, uh, pollution, we're talking about climate change, social and governance related issues and organizations are now expected to report about these, they need to understand the risk implications of ESG and then factor those into their strategy and ensure that governance models are being created to factor in ESG. So all these together throw up a whole series of, of different types of risks, new ways of thinking, new pressures on managements and on boards. Uh, and where these are not being driven by regulation, they are being driven by shareholders. So even more critical that organizations are, are thinking ahead and responding rather than waiting for regulation to, 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 uh, to pave the path. Now, how's the Middle East been doing? Um, you know, clearly um, the Middle East has done really well in the last two decades. There's been a huge amount of activity uh, starting off in 2002 every one of our regional GCC countries have, have rolled out various codes of corporate governance, the laws, commercial company laws have set out basic guidelines, and then the capital markets authorities of each of these countries in which uh, we operate uh, have, have built on these. But overall, the picture that we see is that in the Middle East, corporate governance is principles-based. What the organization, what the regulators do is issue guidelines. These are not prescriptive uh, you know, rules other than in certain areas around the board that, uh, that organizations are expected to comply with. And this is a hugely positive trend because what this does is that it gives organizations the ability to tailor their governance to their specific requirements, right? It's, and this is clearly a key thing. But despite all this uh, regulation, 
And what do we actually see happening here, right? Uh, just a constant flow of corporate failure. There seems to be no end in sight. And what I've tried to do here is just map over the last 20, 25, 30 years, actually, the different corporate failures that we've, we've come across, right? Um, and, and at the bottom, I've just tried to plot the different codes of corporate governance that have come out. So 1995 on the extreme left, the Cadbury report, King's Commission, OECD, and then from 2005 onwards, the various GCC legislations. But everything that you see here suggests that despite the legislation, corporate collapse is just continuing to go on and on. And why is that? It's clearly because what clearly comes down to this whole concept that we talk about as being the tone at the top, right? You can have the best codes, you can have the best rules, you can have the best regulations, but unless boards, senior management, middle managers demonstrate the values, the characteristics and, and, and walk the talk, these sorts of examples will continue. So you only have to look uh, you know, no further than a couple of years ago, Abraj Capital was on the news, Arab Tech, NMC hospitals, all of these um, suggested certain weaknesses that, that are inevitably avoidable, right? I mean, N NMC hospital, for example, uh, and this is a live case going on, so I don't wanna to say too much, but I'm just giving you an example of what, uh, what one reads about. Uh, NMC hospital, uh, massive fraud, $7 billion. But if you look at the way the board was structured, right, it met all the criteria that you would expect from a board. It had independent members. It talked about one third members being independent, all that kind of stuff. Uh, it had the right number of people. It had people of the, potentially the right skills and qualifications. But uh, somebody pointed out that perhaps, you know, that sort of tick box exercise for what a board looks like doesn't actually work because when you just lift the hood in the case of NMC hospitals, what you noticed was that the majority of the board members were foreigners. They came from the UK, not very familiar with our part of the world, not very close to the executive management and therefore not being able to adequately challenge management about what was going on in the business. And therefore the board failed. They ticked the boxes, but they just failed in their job. Yeah. Um, and, and these are just examples of, uh, you know, of, uh, of, uh, of corporate failures. Other examples, for example, in Abraj Capital, again, you know, well publicized information, uh, but in Abraj's case, one anecdote was that the chief risk officer of Abraj uh, was the brother-in-law of the founder, right? Clearly an independence issue. In, in that aspect. So bottom line is that one cannot depend on, on regulation. Uh, one has to take uh, you know, a proactive view of, uh, of, of, of corporate governance and risk management and, and continuously strive to, to change the dynamic. Um, what I thought I would do um, you know, is, is actually just pick in a little more detail about a, a case study that some of you may be familiar with. Uh, and, and this is Nissan. And the reason I, I picked this up is that, A, this is not something from, from our region, uh, but it also highlights to a certain extent what can happen when you have a really dominant uh, and very powerful and influential CEO, how difficult it is for the board and how easily they can be blindsided, right? So, so what happened in, in the Nissan case, and this was just not too long ago, 2016 or so, the statutory auditor received a whistleblower's report Carlos Gosson, who was the, uh, the chairman, was the subject of that whistleblower report. Right? Now, Carlos Gosson was a very powerful man. He, uh, he held very, very senior positions in both Nissan and Rene, and Rene was a significant shareholder in Nissan. So he was someone who was in a position to exercise great influence over the functioning of the board and of the company itself. On paper, when you look at it, Nissan again ticked all the boxes as far as a good corporate governance model would look like, particularly from the point of view of Japanese law. And nobody's saying that Japanese law is, uh, you know, is impeccable or it is, uh, you know, particularly strong. But the fact is, they met the criteria of the law. But one of the key things that they didn't have was just a basic nomination and remuneration committee, an NRC, something that we take for granted. 
in this uh, in in this part of the world. Yeah. Um, something else was also around uh, the composition of the board. Uh, it complied with the usual norms, independent members, and so on. But again, it wasn't fit for purpose, and, and this is why. Uh, corporate governance is, is more than just about the board, but it's also about behaviors that emanate from the board and which percolate down to the rest of the management. So what happened in, in the case of the NRC or of the, uh, I was trying to clear my screen here. What happened in the case of the, uh, of Nissan? So one was that there was no nomination and remuneration committee in NRC, right? The board had given Carlos Gosson authority to determine compensations of the directors in his company and also of himself. Yeah. Um, clearly something that would not have happened had there been a well-functioning NRC. There was a concentration of power. Clearly a personality cult was something that uh, was, uh, was prevalent. Uh, few key people had a lot of power. There was a gentleman by the name of Brett Kelly who was the head of HR, the head of legal and the head of, and the, head of the CEO office. And again, this ties into some of what my other speakers had mentioned earlier on, where they talk about the organization structure and not just of the assurance functions, the organization structure of the entire organization needs to be looked at. There was, uh, it, was uh, it was identified that there was a private use of company funds. So Carlos Gossen was using funds for his private use, private planes, et cetera, but also paying his sister advisory fees. Right, and, and nobody particularly knew what advisory services she was offering. There was something called a CEO reserve. It was a budget item called CEO reserve where Carlos himself was able to utilize that fund for expenditures outside the framework of the budget. There were breaches in compliance disclosures, board meetings, another very interesting thing. Board meetings were apparently less than 20 minutes. The board would come, rubber stamp, and then disappear. Right? And clearly this was all down to the corporate culture that, uh, that had sort of developed in, in, in Nissan because he was viewed as a savior of Nissan. He came in there, he saved this company from collapse and basically nobody could adequately challenge him. Uh, and there was also at the end of the day a failure of these control functions. Did they do their job adequately or did they not? Did they identify these risks on time or did they just let it go? So clearly a number of governance issues uh, some of this resonates in our part of the world, but these are the sorts of things that we need to be keeping our eyes out for, uh, you know, to ensure that uh, similar, you know, issues don't arise in the companies that you're working for. Um, from a Middle East family business perspective, I thought I'd just bring this up again because, uh, you know, family businesses and family-owned businesses are an integral part of our Middle Eastern economies. Uh, you know, they contribute 60, 70, 80% of the GDP. They're huge employers uh, and, and very much, you know, important players in, in our sector. But if you look at, um, you know, their, their sort of survival rates, only 6% or so of family businesses survive beyond the third generation. Less than 3% survive into the fourth generation. And, and what that means is that Without adequate family governance, without proper governance, both family governance as well as corporate governance, very difficult for these organizations to, to plan for the future, to bring in the next generation into their businesses. So governance is, is no less a challenge for these organizations. Uh, governance needs to be looked at from the point of view of both family governance, which is how the family members interact with the business and their, and their role and participation in it, but then also from a corporate governance perspective where you're looking at the whole framework beneath the board. Okay. So what are the implications for, for governance stakeholders in general? And again, just my, my personal uh, thoughts on the topic, uh, there, there needs to be a shift in the current mindset, right? Uh, first around relationships, right? Moving away from a relationship based to what I call a, a principles or a rules-based uh, you know, model of, of corporate governance. Um, regulators and regulations will never be a solution to our problems, right? As I showed you in the earlier slide, we can have all the regulations in the place, but regulations are a response to what people have seen happening live. 
uh, and it takes time for regulations to be implemented. So, so clearly regulations and, and regulators are not going to solve the problem, but they have a very, very important role to play. Corporate governance must also not be seen as a compliance exercise. This is just not going to help if it's going to be a tick box exercise. Often, you know, we are asked by companies to, to come and do a governance assessment. And many times it's a case of, you know, just give me a, a report, tell me whether we've ticked the boxes, whether we've complied with the law, whether we've complied with the guidelines. Just not gonna work. We need to control or strengthen the entire controls environment. And by that, we're talking not just focusing on financial and operational risk. It's looking at strategy risk, look at market risk, it look at you know, it looks at environment. It looks at a very wide range of risks. Uh, scenario planning needs to be done. We need to look at, at, at risk 360 degrees. Board effectiveness, again, remains a, a very critical theme as I've, as I've demonstrated in the earlier slides. Uh, we need to have not just the right numbers or, or, or the right mix, but we need the right people, right? These are people who have the time, the interest and the dedication to fulfill their roles. Right? They need to be subject matter experts on their topics. Uh, they need to bring value to the board. They need to be dynamic board members. And, and, and my last point is really around drilling down into operational governance. It's not enough really to just leave corporate governance at the level of the board. Organizations need to drill down a level. You know, when I talk about operational governance, I'm talking about ensuring that you have policies and procedures in place, that you have delegations of authority in place, that you have subsidiary governance policies in place, uh, and, and so many other themes that drive you know, good, good governance. So what are typical red flags that you might identify or you might be, you know, well, uh, you, it might be important for you to look into? Well, the first one on the top, and these are in no order of priority or, or, or importance, but, but generally these give you an idea of, of what to look for. One is an effective board and management practices, right? It always starts with the board. Um, insufficient oversight over the management of your subsidiaries, as I explained, key factor. A poorly defined risk indicators. As people who sit in the finance function with the financial background, these are important areas for you to, uh, to look at. A, a lack of integration between governance risk compliance uh, and, and legal functions. Uh, all too often, as I mentioned earlier, each of these are, are operated in silos. You sometimes find compliance sitting under legal, risk under finance, or risk governance under a secretariat. None of them are really talking to each other. So, so looking into that, the organizational model, quite critical. Um, second row on the left, ethics and a governance and policy framework. Again, very important. Um, and, and not to be seen as just a tick box exercise. It's not enough to just have an ethics and the governance policy uh, to be kept on the shelf. Uh, there need to be disclosures. There need to be voluntary disclosures. The board secretary needs to, to focus on these matters and ensure that uh, they are in place and are being activated in the business. You also need to look out for conflict of interest, related party transactions weak financial reporting, information systems, misaligned authority matrices. Uh, again, this is an, an easy one to look out for because organizations have authority matrices, but many a time these are uh, either too detailed or not strategic enough. Uh, and ultimately they become a reflection of your policies and procedures, which is again, not the purpose of a, an authority matrix. Uh, authority matrices are also not just about assigning financial limits to, uh, you know, to, to individual positions in the organizations. It's much more than that. And it can be made a very real and tangible document uh, to, you know, to, to ensure that there's good governance in place. Transparency and disclosure, of course, is you know, uh, the lack of transparency or the lack of adequate disclosure, even if it's not uh, you know, mandated by law, can and should be something that uh, internal auditors members of, you know, of the finance community must push, particularly with the C-suite and they in turn with, the, uh, with their boards. Poor management information systems as well. We often come across this, uh, you know, you've got Excel on one hand, you've got ERP on the other, you've got systems that don't talk to each other. This is changing, this is improving. But, but again, depending on the size and maturity for your organizations, 
this might be something to, to keep an eye out. And of course, fraud, it always starts with something small, but it could be an indication of potential control weaknesses and therefore quite important uh, and an easily uh, uh, sort of uh, an easy red flag to, to, to take notice of. So how should you respond? I know I've, I've talked about, you know, the key themes that are emerging. I've talked about some, uh, you know, so some red flags that you could look at, but if as an organization, um, how do you go about this entire process of, of looking at governance and ensuring that it rises up uh, to a standard that protects shareholder value? Well, depending on where you are, you can either start off right at the beginning, which is do an assessment, right? See where you currently stand. Uh, maturity assessments, benchmarking, et cetera, can all be done. Um, there is a good amount of information available, but you might need some help in doing that. So, so clearly that's the starting point. And when we talk about assessing, it's not just assessing the board. It's about assessing the board, their functioning. It's about the entire strategy and planning and monitoring uh, process. It's about risk. It's about transparency. It's about reporting. And it's also about ESG. So multiple dimensions along which to assess your corporate governance activities. You then look at your entire framework, right? As I said, we need to get away from, from looking at governance risk and compliance in a silo. We need to start thinking about integrated frameworks, yeah? bringing these together and ensuring that you have the right stakeholders paying adequate attention to each of these factors. Effective implementation, of course, is absolutely key. We can do all the best assessment, we can do all the good design we want, but if this is not actually implemented and not translated into action on the ground, uh, there is actually no point in doing any of this. And to do this, obviously, there's technology in place. Uh, there are, are plenty of technology solutions and technology service providers out there who can, who can help you leverage this. But as a speaker previously said, uh, technology on its own is not going to solve your problem, right? It, it has to be aligned with, uh, you know, the, the, the needs of the business, the risks of the business, the future strategy of the business. Uh, number four is just consistent communication and raising awareness. This is something that is absolutely critical. This is not a topic which only affects, you know, the board or senior management, it affects everybody at all levels in the organization. So periodically, there needs to be, in my opinion, uh, you know, uh, updates provided, online training, courses, uh, information, and, and so on, that ensures that everybody is aware of what is meant by governance, what is meant by governance in the context of their own organization in particular. And finally, reviewing an update. Like I said, it's not a one-time activity. You communicate it, and then periodically, organizations need to go back to it. Every year, every couple of years, focus on a different part of your organization or your governance model, do a scan, identify opportunities for improvement, and bring it up to the board. My conclusion slide is, is again, just a personal perspective on governance in the future. A few key themes that I thought I'd share with you. Uh, one is that, look, the fundamentals of, of good governance remain the same. Right? It's about shareholders, it's about the board, it's how management, it's how they interact with each other. That's not going to change. But what is changing is the environment in which the shareholders, board and management have to operate. We're in a digital world, right? We're working from home, we're facing issues like COVID. So the fundamentals change, but it's also about extending that, remain the same, but it's also about extending that definition to look at other areas. So it's not only just about the board. There needs to be a shift in focus. This is not just, you know, corporate governance is not just something around a control or a compliance sort of activity. It needs to be looked at holistically and, and it doesn't have to be done all at the same time. It can be broken down into its different parts, but there needs to be a shift in focus starting from the top and moving all the way down to, you know, to the operations of the business. You know, we hear different new themes emerging. You know, we, we talked about agile governance and so on. Uh, and these are really good definitions because what they do is emphasize new themes, for example, values, behaviors, cultures, mindset. And it's not just about rules and processes because you can have the you know, you can have the best rules, the best processes, but unless people respond in terms of behaviors 
and and what they do on the ground, none of this is going to work. Yeah. And last but not the least is also focus on emerging themes. Uh, we've got to factor in themes around CSR, ESG, privacy, data security. All this needs to be factored into your thinking, uh, in, in the, the risks associated with them, and therefore what governance model can you develop around that to ensure that your entire governance model is uh, is robust. So, so with that, um, I will come to an end to my presentation and uh, I'll pass it on to the organizers for any uh, questions and, uh, and taking it forward from there. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Harinder Kailath, uh, for an excellent presentation. And you also specifically, you shared that uh, Middle East uh, governance examples as well. At the last, you have given a personal perspective of governance in future. So, which was very excellent. And uh, I think before we start q and I have a question for you. As you mentioned that tone at the top has to be right. If top management collides, corporate fails. And there are many more examples which you have cited and we have also seen, and it will continue in future as well. Then in this kind of scenario, I mean, how CRO or the head of compliance will manage this kind of situation? Okay. Can you throw some light on this? Yeah. So, so, so look, I think you know the CRO, the head of compliance. These are all individual stakeholders in the wider corporate governance uh, universe of an organization. Uh, right. In my view, uh, they are key functions. They sit under the assurance functions. They need to report their findings periodically. They need to do so in the way that the other speakers have have said they must, which is, frankly. Uh, and to do it transparently. Uh, and, and ultimately, it, it comes down to ensuring that those messages are being uh, communicated to the board of directors and the board are able to actually act on it. Right? Um, and, and I think this is where uh, recommendations and observations should be made in a way that is strategic. Uh, yeah. It needs to demonstrate value. It needs to show how shareholders' rights uh, and, and their investment is being protected. So by doing that, I feel, uh, you know, there is a greater chance for, for these functions to perform more effectively. Right, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kailat, for an excellent presentation. And uh, now I request our chairman, CA Sundar Nurani, or rather maybe we can have a small q and I will invite our XCOM member, CA Jayaprakash Agarwal for q and Thank yeah, you. Hare Krishnanji. In fact, yes, uh, uh, CA Nagesh and CA Ram uh, both are here with us because uh, we were not able to attend to all their questions. No, um, sir, I, I will do that now. Yeah, but if any members uh, want to ask questions, so they are also here. In fact, Mr. Nagesh had some other meeting, but he was uh, very happy to come back and join us back. So any questions, uh, they are ready to answer. Done, sir. Yeah, yeah thank we'll you. Take, we will take them on board, sir. Yeah. All right, sir. You have seen Avengers? I'll be honest, J JP, I haven't. Uh, you have not seen. Avengers is his hit because all the stalwarts are there. And now, this is the last part of the section where I have all the stalwarts, including you, Mr. Nagesh, Mr. Ram, everyone is there. And that will be a delight for all the members because they had questions. I stopped them in between. Now, I have the courtesy to have you all together and address those questions. So we'll go with the lady first. I've seen her for last 25 minutes. Her hand is up. It must be paining a lot. Shruti, you have to come online and you can ask your question. Shruti, are you around? Okay, we'll go to the next one. You, 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 she's, she's on mute. Yeah, she's... Uh... No, no, I'm here now. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, thank you, yes. thank you, Jay. Uh, my question is for Mr. Ramakrishnan. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ramakrishnan, for a very insightful session earlier. Uh, my question is, what are some of the effective e-performance indicators for assessing and uh, monitoring the performance of a risk department within an organization? Very interesting question, because, uh, you know, this is like saying that who, who uh, hunts the hunter or something like that. I mean, essentially, Basically, uh, the, the, the point here is that risk department, I mean, at least I can talk from a financial services point of view, it is not 
one department. Like what I said, if you look at it, my own case, I have about uh, about 14 departments working for me. So again, it goes back to the adage that it's not one size fits all. But in general, if you want to ask me, you know, what what will be the success of a good risk department? Yes. Uh, it will be it will be to proactively uh, uh, first of all understand the risk fears, set the right risk appetite. When I say the right risk appetite, it is the appropriate risk appetite for the for the organization, and being able to monitor the risk and highlight the risk well in advance. Like what I said, if it's already happened, it's no longer a risk, it's an event. So yes. essentially the, the success of a good risk department is one to set the right risk appetite, be able to monitor it and be able to uh, uh, be able to escalate well on time and kind of anticipate risk if I may. Again, I'm going back, uh, maybe I'm contradicting myself when I said this because it's not all risk can be anticipated like this pandemic, for example, but truly that will be the that would be the that would be the success of a risk department. So it's all key risks around that. Like for example, if an event has happened, was it well within the risk appetite, or you know, did we did we go way above, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I guess yes, that's what it is. It's interesting you say this because I I work in risk management as well, and in one of my previous organizations, one of the measures that was used to uh, monitor uh, enterprise risk management was risk identification where we were told that uh, if you have not identified critical risks uh, well in time, uh, you know, that's something that you will be penalized for. So, you know, the, you always have emerging risks which are lurking somewhere in the background which you may not identify. So, uh, you know, but how is it that you can penalize the risk function for not being able to identify something unless, you know, it becomes, uh, you know, there are some sort of uh, uh, indicators that you use in order to identify that risk. So it's interesting to get your thoughts on it as well. No, this is interesting because like what I said, you know, end of the day, uh, you know, if you are running a risk function, you cannot be having low hanging fruits around, meaning you cannot have somebody come and take you for a ride, essentially. Uh, like eventually, I mean, if, if you say that nothing should go wrong in this world, it is yes. not true. You know, yes. you can have a fortress and still you could have a robbery in that. The question is how smart was the robber and how uh, difficult was it for, for him to get inside? That's the question. If it was right. an easy kill that you could just uh, take, uh, come in and take out whatever you wanted, then it is the problem of security. Essentially, that's what it is. Right. Yes. Yes. Thank you uh, very much. Thank you. Thank you, Shruti, for that question. I'll uh, go on. Uh, Mr. Nagesh, uh, one question for you is, do you suggest, suggest that CEO be a permanent attendee to the audit committee? CEO should be permanent attendee in the audit committee meetings. What, what's your recommendation? The CEO needs to come in only for select items. And when the chair of audit committee or the audit committee members feel it necessary to do the things. Because I think uh, chairman of the board and MD and CEO should not be there as a permanent invitee, but they should be invited for specific kind of things. And that is the best option and that is the best practice. So in the interest, I mean, because of the time availability and other stuff, he should be there, but for only for the important things. Yeah, and he, he needs to come in only for that typical kind of thing for some clarification or some assurances on that. Makes sense, sir. With this, and we have also, another... and also there is a process that audit committee matters are reported back to the board around that time. The same can be communicated to chairman of the company as well as to other board members, including the MDC. Makes sense, sir. Be selective, but you have he needs to be included. With this, we go to the next question. Mr. Raghunath, sir, you have one question for our speakers. Yeah, uh, just a question for Mr. Harindra. Uh, see, we talked about governance. Uh, now, there are plenty of cases of failures where uh, the tenure of the CEO has been actually a, a cause of failure. You know, because the person over the period has probably built up the organization, whether it's Carlos Goen or many innumerable examples, you know, where because of the tenure and because of the sheer, uh, you know, uh, performance of theirs, they become so important that uh, they've sort of become unquestionable. And that's eventually led to failures. Now, would you recommend some sort of, you know, what kind of balance can you think of between, uh, you know, tenure and managing uh, this kind of uh, freedom? In a practical sense, I mean, theoretically, yes, there are a lot of things, but in a realistic <laughs> world. I'm not sure. Yeah, thank you for that question, uh, Raghu. Well, and yes. I don't know how much of a practical answer I can give you, 
Um, but, <laughs> because, you know, once you appoint a CEO, you, yeah. you want to keep the CEO long enough that he adds value. Uh, right. but equally, the board needs to be strong enough to recognize when a CEO has, uh, has uh, you know, has gone past the point where he's adding value, but instead mm -hmm. is in fact, you know, taking away value. Right. Yeah. And, and Facebook is a really good example of that. Right. You've got yes. Mark Zuckerberg sitting there. Yes. Absolute powerhouse. You can't dominate him. <laughs> he set up a board uh, and everybody is saying, asking what sort of question, you know, the, the board is, you know, what sort of board, what sort of board he has. So I think this is a difficult question. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think the board needs to be very uh, strong, dynamic and tough about this. They need to review it and also recognize that, look, CEOs function very effectively at different stages in the organization. The CEO who was, who was brought in when, when the organization was a startup, uh, you know, might not be the next most, the best guy for, uh, for, uh, for a different level of maturity uh, in the organization. So I think, you know, uh, there is no recipe to this. Uh, I think tough decisions. And mm -hmm. ultimately when boards take these decisions, they need to do so in the light of what is right for the shareholder, right? If you put on that hat, then you know you, your your decision becomes easier. Thank you, Mr. Ravi. Question. Uh, one interesting question. This is for all of you, and then we'll go to Mr. Sunil. This question is for all of you, and I want to understand. You know, in the current environment, high tech technology is getting used, and not only technology is used by us, but by the hackers as well. Hackers are using technology, right? What steps as risk, risk compliance team you will recommend for the organizations to take to ensure or to protect the organization when technology is at peak? We'll can start. I, yes, sir. Can I take that answer uh, question? Uh, yes, because this is clearly one of the emerging risks which I spoke about. Again, if you look at it, it is. It's not. It's a very simple. Uh, it's not. It's a one question, but multiple answers. One is. You cannot have one tool that will protect everything from everybody. You need to have multiple layers of secu security when it comes to hacking. Number one, not only your, your perimeter security should be strong, that people cannot hack into your system, including you know, protection from DDoS and so on and so forth. And not only that, but then if one by mistake, one email comes in or with the, with the, with the malware or whatever it is from a hacker, how does it pass through your or within your internal network. So you are you need to have your perimeter security, right? And if anything comes in, you need to have your internal network secured and monitored. And that's where I said, talked about anomaly detection, because you need to know if there is any anomaly happening in your network, you need to be able to identify that. So you need a internal detection anomaly tool. You need a perimeter security tool. And, and more importantly, you need to have awareness. I mean, this this clearly is absolutely important that that it's not just enough that you build whatever it is. You need to have complete awareness. And one thing which you have to be very cautious of is is whitelisting, because you know you, you put all these kind of uh, security uh, you know uh, firewalls uh, so that uh, certain emails doesn't go to certain uh, body and all this external email protected. But then somebody says, uh, oh no 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 my my top management, you know, we cannot have the hassle of everything all being stuck by a firewall. So let's whitelist them. So it just takes one guy to click one wrong email, which will which will kind of come bring down the network. So that that's another problem because if you look at it today, even if we take, I'm sorry, I'm taking a bit long for this answer. The question is, even if we take phishing as an example, you know, gone are the days when people send some you know, throw a wide net and see if say, anybody gets caught. Today, we have something called spear phishing. People know exactly what somebody is doing in an organization and try and try and get him. Uh, I mean, I don't want to give ideas, but basically we go to LinkedIn of people, you know what each one is doing. And we proudly say what we are doing in the organization in LinkedIn. So it clearly says what he is responsible for. So you can actually go and attack one guy. And if he is vulnerable, he's finished. Uh, I mean, the organization is finished, which is why the answer is multiple layers of security. Uh, you know, one is inside out, outside in, secure, within the network, security, awareness. And like what I said, two other important stuff is third party, third party security and insider threat, which is your own employees. I think it's a combination of all of this could actually help. 
like what I said, you know, things are things are getting uh, more and more uh, uh, what do you call more and more difficult to protect. But having said that, there is no one solution for uh, for this. Perfect, sir. Uh, Nagesh, sir, for you, I mean, yes, security is required. The sub. Do you think reskilling is required for the auditors? I mean, the way we were doing it, old school thought, old schools. You think complete reskilling and revamping to understand white listing, to understand networking, audits of all these stuff is required by internal audit department. It's it's not. It, it, you know, one thing is very clear. You can't create. You know, you will only have one Amitabh Bachchan. Now I am answering it in your uh, you know answer. Or one Kishore Kumar who can produce, direct everything. What kind of versatility? Almost all committee team. I mean, internal audit team has you know single kind of specializations revolving around that. You can't make them you know um, almost like an expert in everything. Even if you decide to give training. So I think the best thing is to keep on. outsourcing what a talent you don't have in house and rely on that and that is a better option only thing i'm saying is after some 2 years or 3 years change that service provider and get into something more on this it related part that is one and second thing that i must caution you is you know uh, i am more worried about those uh, you know i would say points which remain in your system which go un undetected and that is where data pilferage is happening probably the organization doesn't realize it they are far more dangerous than something which is regular kind of thing which are easy to find out and i think that kind of expertise as i rightly said parameter security and all i think these are critical part that you have to keep on looking at it on that account and one more and last thing i was caution all of you you know uh, there is one great report of certified that financial fraud analyst you know cfe had they comes out every year is something called report to the nation which is on that you know fraud related part on that account 2021 report has not come but 2020 report says it takes about 14 months time for any kind of fraud to get to come undetected on that account and why i am saying this because now it's almost 14 months that have happened after all that you know covid related part have come we are all out of the office so by the time you will go back to the office normally you will realize a lot of things are already in store for you to go and detect those particular part so that is again one thing i thought i'll just tell you thank you sir i'll i mean yes that it's there uh, we are pressed for time sunil ji i can see your hand but we are pressed for time uh, for press for time and because of pressing of time i'll go back to secretary otherwise is already said jay you are overshooted it so sir back to you hari sir yeah thank you very much uh, c a jay prakash agarwal for managing the q and a uh, now i request our chairman c a sundar nurani to join and present the certificate of appreciation to mr harender kala Yeah, thank you, uh, Secretary Saab. Thank you, Harinder Kailath, for taking time to address the members. Uh, very insightful talk and uh, very uh, good examples. Uh, I hope uh, uh, all the points uh, what uh, you mentioned will be kept uh, with the members. Uh, I know that uh, Middle East market is emerging, uh, so uh, probably as the time passes by, uh, there will be more robust, uh, you know, I mean, controls on uh, internal controls and. Uh, Uh, corporate governance, uh, including ESG reporting, uh, we all hope for the best. And uh, thank you very much, sir. Hari uh, Krishan, see you. over to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, now I think uh, we have reached to the last part of the event, which is vote of thanks. I think uh, I will. I will do the vote of thanks. First of all, uh, just a moment. I think there is some problem in the. Sir, you go ahead. No problem. I am checking. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. First of all, I would like to thank our chief guest, Mr. Faris Ahmed Tiyai, our speaker, C A Nake Na Nagesh Pinge, C A K C A K S Balak uh, Rama Krishnan, and Mr. Harendra Kailath for excellent presentation and sharing few tips for our members as well. now i would like to thank our managing committee as well for their whole hearted efforts for planning and execution of uh, this event i would also like to thank our sponsors who have always supported us in all our endeavors our principal sponsors tally lulu our platinum sponsors uh, uhy james ifco hlb hemp and i also thank our media partner khalish times institutional partner delhi private school and banking partner bank of baroda 
At the end, many thanks to all our members for their active participation. Stay safe, stay connected, and thank you very much. Once again, have a nice evening. Uh, Jay, thank I you. Unmute all so that we can uh, meet and greet. <laughs> yeah. Unmuted all. Anyone can now unmute themselves and come on this. Uh, on the screen and thanks the speakers or any comments, any feedbacks, all are appreciated. Please yeah. go ahead. Feedback thank can be put much. in the chat box as well. You can put thank it in you the very chat much. box. Thank you very much, everyone. This was such a wonderful session and it was lovely to hear varied experiences of seasoned professionals, actually. I would like to add one small thing to what Mr. Ramakrishnan was mentioning is that nowadays there are certain special tools which have come by which you can actually measure and identify what is the internet data which is going across within an organization? So the database administrator can on daily basis examine what nodes are being pulled on and used. So by this, we can actually help identify what is happening where. It is a very effective tool. One of my clients is working on it and doing this in US and they, are, they, are, they have created this as a wonders and they are doing it for more than 15 years now. So this is an important tool, which I think the house should think about to control any unidentified connections coming into your own organizational networks. Thank you, okay. sir. Very insightful. Thank you. Thank you for giving us the tips. Uh, Batraji, thank you very much. Okay, sir. Have a nice evening. <laughs> Anyone can go unmute, say something. We love to hear from you. Physical meeting is bad. Hoja ti yaha paise hi karna padega. Sir, yeah. sir, there. The children should only listen and learn. Thank you. Ah, city sir. Good evening. Long yes, holidays. Sir. We are getting long holidays. Long weekend. Five days weekend now. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank, 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 thank you. you all. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Good night, Sunny. Bye bye. bye, -bye.